All right, good morning, committee. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're waiting for a few more members to, to, uh, to get here so that we have um, everyone here, but uh, we have a couple online. and, and uh, So I'm going to skip the approval of the minutes until we have a few more people here, and we'll come back to it and then um, later this, this morning or this afternoon. So we'll go ahead and start with um, the LPA uh, audit of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation system. And um, we do not have a, a representative from KBI here today, but um, James is going to send out information to, um, to everybody of contact for KBI, correct? Yes. yes. So that if you have questions, you can uh, contact them but uh, there was a snafu and of uh, information as far as, I guess, that. And so uh, they, they do not have someone here today. But uh, Justin, go ahead and if you could come up. and Welcome, I guess, for a little bit longer. We hate to see you go. Yeah. Right. Anyway, we can offer you a lot more money and you stay. <laughs> no, sir. Thank you very much. I feel... uh, that's probably a good thing because I can't do that. So <laughs> Yeah, that's yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Justin Stowe. I'm your legislative auditor, at least for another month. I've been uh, recruited by one of my previous co-workers in Washington State. So I'm going to go there in about a month and be working up there uh, for him. Uh, but for the meantime, I'm yours for the next month at least. So I'm filling in currently for my IT audit manager, Katrin Osterhaus. She had some family business and is out of the country actually taking care of that. So I'll be here talking about KBI a little bit, and then I'll be here a little bit later this afternoon to cover one of the IT security audit presentations. Um, if I can't answer one of your questions, because I'm not necessarily the specific subject matter expert, you know, I will take down your questions and we'll try to get back to you after. So. Uh, the good news is on this one, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, is a very short and brief report. It's just a little memo that we put in front of you. One of the things that the legislature did several years ago is it put us in the business of monitoring the state's IT projects. And the idea was simple. You all were tired of hearing from us as your auditors that 10 years into an IT project, the state had spent you know tens of millions of dollars and didn't have a viable product to speak of for all of its efforts. And the idea, and this has been done in several other states, was, hey, let's get the auditors involved in some of these projects as they go along so we can raise the red flag if we think that anything is kind of going off the rails. And so our office has been doing this for several years. Uh, we've been kind of tracking these IT projects. It's not audit work per se. It's a little bit different. We just actually sit in on the meetings and kind of watch and listen and participate, but kind of act as the legislature's neutral representation in terms of just making sure that we're keeping an eye on these projects. So the one that I'm gonna talk about today is the one we've been monitoring since January 2020, and that's the KBI's updated fingerprinting system. So the system they're currently using uh, is getting quite old, is actually will be out of support by 2022. So it's kind of nearing the end of its life, and they've been working on a project to replace that. So um, we keep track of this project. It's not necessarily the most expensive project in the state, but this fingerprinting system is used by a lot of the state's criminal justice organizations, so it's pretty important uh, kind of from the state's perspective of enforcing, uh, you know, for law enforcement to be able to do their job. What you'll notice on this memo is that three out of the four areas that we look at are in satisfactory status, so that's good news. The project scope is in satisfactory status. Uh, it was actually put into the audit contract or into the contract for this project. Uh, you can see there on July 8th, 2021, so when they created the contract, that locked, locked the scope in. We thought it looked pretty good, pretty solid. Likewise, project cost is also satisfactory. So uh, our most recent estimate is that the project is going to cost around $5.5 million. Um, that's gone through several iterations, but that's currently where it stands. The project also, the contract also includes an 18-month warranty period on the system. So for that period, we the state can get free maintenance if something goes wrong. After that, we have the option uh, to get additional maintenance support uh, for $100,000 a year for up to 15 years to just try to keep that system up and running. Third, project security is satisfactory. So one of the things we look for is as they build these systems, are they including important security features? Are they considering security when they build these? Because of course, as your IT security auditors, we're always worried about the ability of hackers to breach these type of systems. So we look for that as they build these new systems and we see that they have taken the proper considerations as they kind of spec out at least the project plan. 
The one area that we do note the project is in caution status. Um, and that's simply because the, the project um, was supposed to, it kind of allowed, the contract allowed for 18 months total for the execution of the project, but the KBI was several, a couple months late in actually getting the contract signed, which shortened that period, and so has put that project deadline just under a little bit more duress. So we wanna kind of highlight that, you know, that they, the, the vendor has already agreed that it thinks it can meet those more stringent, you know, parameters. The problem is, of course, since the system goes, the current system goes out of date in December 2022, and we're aiming for November 2022, we don't have tons of wiggle room there to try to get the, you know, the new one up and running before we retire the old one. So uh, not urgent yet. We, we raise the red flag, it gets worse, but that's the one area where we noticed a little bit of maybe potential future concern. We're keeping an eye on this project, currently working with the KBI to get an update that we'll be releasing to our committee soon, and then we can, by extension, let you know. So, Mr. Chairman, that covers my memo on this project. Happy to answer any questions the committee members may have. Committee, any questions? Justin, I can't remember. Did we fund that last year or the year before? I believe it was last year. We, we brought this issue to the legislature because we were concerned it did not have funding. I think actually we, we note that uh, you were able to use some of the COVID funding and set an appropriation side. The LCC approved that, so they did get some funding from the, the legislature. Yes, sir. I was just trying, is that what delayed them from getting it started quicker? I don't know about that, Mr. Chairman. I know it was kind of a highlighted concern, and we actually wrote some memos to you all highlighting that we're, we think this is in trouble because it at one time did not have funding, but then the legislature was able to take action, and we were able to clear that. I don't know if that's directly connected to the right. two-month delay. I remember. Delay. I thought it was a couple of years ago they brought it to us and yeah. said we really need to get this done, so I couldn't remember. Yeah. Representative Pittman. I think um, they thought they had highlighted it to the budget subcommittee but they hadn't highlighted it enough so that we were aware that that was an issue. And then they brought it to our committee as an emergency and we kind of pushed back. We, yeah, I think it was about a year and a half ago. We pushed back and said, hey, look, if it's an emergency, you ought to have uh, really uh, raised it up as a bigger, higher flag. And I'm glad that they're actually getting the funding for it through this uh, COVID relief fund. Right. I just, I couldn't remember if we funded it in the, in the uh, 21 session or the 20 session. That was what I was trying to. To, to figure out that. Uh, Senator Peterson. Justin, do you know if the IV and V contractors involved throughout the project? Senator, they are, and in fact, we have recently just received uh, one of their first reports, and so we will be dissecting the results of that and be able to report back to Post Audit Committee and JCIT on kind of the contents of that. So they are currently involved in, in looking into the project, working along with it. And I appreciate the fact that they did hire an IV and V. Yep. And as we know, Senator, in this report, it's not required because the project is under the $10 million threshold that is usually associated with IBMV, but it's a good practice, and KBI was proactive in doing that, so we agree that that was a, a good step. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone online questions? Okay. Justin, thank you. Thank you, sir. So next, we're going to have um, the limited scope uh, school audit, uh, the IT audit, and looks like Heidi, you're going to do that for us. Thank you, Heidi. Good morning, committee. All right, I am Heidi Zimmerman. I'm a principal auditor, legislative post audit, and I supervised this limited scope audit. Uh, so. First of all, I'm gonna give you kind of what the question to the audit was and give you a very brief answer, and then I'll kind of circle back and give you a, a more detailed answer uh, to the question. So first of all, the, the audit has a single question. What do school districts report regarding IT security standards and resources? Um, and the very brief answer to, to that question is that many school districts have not implemented basic IT security controls. So a little bit of background first. Uh, school districts maintain a variety of sensitive data on students, and that includes some obvious things like grades and disciplinary actions, but they also maintain records on things like medical and mental health and financial information as well. But school districts also have a number of threats that could result in an unauthorized person accessing that confidential data. That includes things like a data breach, uh, phishing scams, ransomware attacks, and these kinds of uh, attacks on school districts have increased 
uh, in recent years. And in March of 2021, the K-12 Cybersecurity Resource Center reported an 18% increase in IT security incidences in school districts uh, in 2020. Uh, additionally, a 2020 Government Accountability Office report noted that large and affluent school districts had disproportionately more data breaches than smaller districts. Uh, so clearly, uh, this is an area where districts uh, do face some threats. Uh, although the districts do maintain uh, a number of sensitive uh, data and documents, districts, though, are not required to implement any specific IT controls. So state and federal laws restrict who has access to student data. So the Federal uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which is also known as FERPA, uh, requires written permission from a guardian to release information from a student's educational record. Uh, the Kansas Student Data Privacy Act uh, also restricts who districts and the Department of Education, uh, who they can release certain information to. But neither law requires districts to implement any specific IT security controls to prevent unauthorized access to that data. There are also uh, state laws that require state agencies to adopt certain IT security controls, but those laws do not apply to school districts. Uh, and last, uh, Department of Education does not require anything specific uh, either in terms of uh, IT security controls of school districts. So basically we have a situation where districts have requirements to protect data, but they don't have any requirements for how to protect that data. We'll talk a little bit about the detailed answer to the audit question, and I'm on page three. So we sent surveys to all 286 school districts and to the Kansas schools for the deaf and the blind. We asked districts to report on the practices that their districts have currently implemented across several IT security control areas. 51% responded to our survey. And given that high response rate, we think that these results are reasonably representative of the district statewide. Uh, but returning the survey was voluntary, and that can introduce some self-selection bias. So districts, as I mentioned before, districts are not required to implement any specific controls, but there are a number of basic controls that are good practices. And we asked districts about some of those good basic practices. What we found was that the majority of school districts reported lacking several of those basic IT security controls. And so, for example, and the details of this are on page four, the figure there in the middle of the page. 58% of districts uh, told us that they do not require security awareness training for their staff at any time. Standards suggest that staff should attend security awareness training when they're hired and then annually after that. 59% of districts do not require confidential data to be encrypted when sending it outside of their networks. All confidential data should be encrypted when it leaves the network. 65% of districts told us they do not scan their computer systems for vulnerabilities as often as standards suggest. And that included 35% of districts that reported they never scan their computer network. Standards suggest that organizations scan their networks at least monthly. And last, 69% told us they did not have an incident response plan. And without that plan, the risks are much greater that an organization cannot recognize or respond to a security incident quickly or effectively. We also noted that small school districts lag behind uh, the bigger districts. So a small district has uh, 500, or fewer 500 or fewer students. A large district has uh, 3,000 or more students. And we found that those small districts are behind those big districts. So for example, 67% of small districts reported having antivirus installed on all of the district's computers, but 80% of large districts did. 33% of small districts reported scanning their computers at least monthly, but 55% of large districts do so. We also asked districts to rate the significance of various barriers to implementing adequate IT security controls. The detail to, the, to that question is on the bottom of page five in that figure. So as you can see in that figure, staff-related issues were the most significant barriers. About half of the districts reported that their ability to hire sufficient IT staff and to pay them competitively 
were significant barriers. Districts also reported some other difficulties in our survey. Uh, several reported that the lack of guidance from the state was problematic. And a few also noted that it's difficult to get staff to implement security practices because they're viewed as inconvenient. We also interviewed a number of stakeholders, including the Department of Education, a service center, a private company that provides IT services to districts and to several school districts. Every person we interviewed reported that a lack of knowledge or training was a challenge that they faced. Most of them also reported that guidance from the state would help them better implement IT security controls. However, a couple of them thought that imposing requirements could be met with some resistance. We also asked districts to estimate their IT security expenditures. On average, districts reported spending about $18 per student. In comparison, districts spent on average a total of a little more than $16,000 per student. We also looked for national benchmarks for IT security expenditures in schools, but we didn't find any. So as a result, we can't say whether the expenditures that the districts reported to us are reasonable or not. Uh, we should note here, though, that the federal government provided uh, additional funding to school districts uh, to offset expenditures related to COVID. And the federal government does allow districts to use that funding for certain uh, IT security uh, related activities. Our last finding is on page seven. And we found three states that require school districts to implement specific IT security controls. Uh, due to some time constraints, we could not do a comprehensive search uh, for IT security control requirements in other states, uh, but we did identify a few. So first of all, New Hampshire and New York, uh, both of those states require their departments of education to establish minimum IT security uh, standards for their school districts. We also found that in Texas, uh, they require their school districts to adopt a cybersecurity policy. They're also required to designate a cybersecurity coordinator. We made one recommendation, and that is to the Kansas legislature to consider directing the Department of Education to establish a set of minimum IT security standards for school districts in the form of either guidance or requirements. So that ends my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Committee, any questions? Um, not sure I have any just right off the bat either, but it does. I, I remember when this came out, and it, it did. It was quite a bit of uh, concern about the lack of of IT um, response. I guess one of the things that, and this isn't necessarily a question, I guess, for you, but, you know, with the smaller districts could, they could contract out, uh, you know, there's firms that do IT and things like that. I, I'm not sure why they would have to hire someone, and even the bigger firms could too, but... Uh, some of the smaller districts do already contract out for their IT services, maybe not necessarily for the security component, um, but some of these districts are already contracting out uh, to get the services they need. Okay, I would think that'd be a good way to it. Uh, Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a little bit of a concern over whose parameter was it for the dollar amount on how much is spent on IT security. To me, that is a a poor measure because you could be um, spending an exorbitant amount of money in a wasteful manner. There, there is no benchmark. Uh, we looked for some benchmarks to see if what they reported to us kind of made sense. Was it reasonable? Unfortunately, we just weren't able to find any benchmarks that would allow us to kind of make that call. So what we have here is just what they reported to us. Uh, we asked them to just report to us what they spit now, on IT security specifically, not IT generally, but IT security specifically, um, and then just took that number and converted it into a per student amount. If I may, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the follow-up. So that was legislative post-audit's idea to get an idea of what they're spending on IT security. I believe it was in the, it was in the uh, question okay. that we were asked. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Senator Pittman. Uh, I do find this recommendation to be a good recommendation um, from the LPN. I appreciate it. Did, did you guys look at security with the students? You know, a lot of times during the COVID uh, pandemic, we issued a lot of laptops, tablets uh, across the state. Was there any kind of self-reported, understanding this is self-reported, um, consideration to the students' uh, machines versus kind of the staff's machines and things like that, or that wasn't differentiated? We did not differentiate that in the, in the questions. We just asked kind of general questions about, you know, do you, do you, do you, you know, school district, do you do these things? Um, and we didn't differentiate uh, that out. Uh, we did put some qualifiers on things where we asked a question about, you know, is this done on all the district's computers? In that case, that should include student computers because those are the district's computers, not the student. So we did hear from a couple of the districts we talked to that uh, they did issue a whole lot of um, laptops and things during COVID. Uh, of course, many districts are already on a one-to-one, -one, uh, but some that aren't suddenly had to very quickly become one-to-one. -one. And they did talk a little bit about the, the difficulties of that and the security controls or security concerns that come along with very rapidly having to deploy a lot of laptops to students. Just one other question. Um, if, so about how much effort did this audit take versus maybe one that would be a little bit more extensive if we were to get dive into it? Um, what are we talking about? Is this, was this like a month worth of effort from an LPA standpoint and a deeper one might take three or four months? Yeah, this was a limited scope. So limited scope audits are done in about 100 hours. So the field work component takes just a couple of weeks. And so obviously you'll notice pretty much we, we did a survey. That was the bulk of the, the audit. A, a more detailed uh, audit kind of depends on what question you ask. Uh, the more questions you ask or the more complicated they get, the longer it could take. Uh, but a deeper dive probably would take at least a few months. Rep. Zim Curtis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to kind of step back to kind of a higher level, you hear echoes of things that this committee has has heard and struggled with for some time now, and you know part of the challenges that everyone is feeling with um, um, staffing and IT talent. Um, there's more demand than what we have a pipeline for of talent for. Um, the other thing is. Um, just making sure that this is a priority at the highest level. So when the school districts at the very highest level consider this to be a priority, then you start seeing a better focus and um, ability to address some of these issues. I think this is a good recommendation as well. I know we're gonna hear some presentations this afternoon, um, um, like from the Cybersecurity Task Force. And I know that staff has been having some of these conversations about how the state can help provide some assistance and guidance to some of our other local units of government because we all interface and you know what what they do impacts us and what we do impacts them and so we need to make sure that we're all addressing this um, collaboratively so anyway just some thoughts um, as we um, hear this report um, and I think it's good that there is a greater focus. We are shedding light. We are showing where the vulnerabilities are. And now it's up to us to try to put the tools in place so that we can address them. So thank you. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point because the audits that we see a lot on the school districts, you know, a lot of them are kind of in the same vein, I guess, as far as the issues that we're seeing with those. So. Uh, and that, that kind of that goes back to um, previous question as far as the difference between those audits and this audit that, that you do for the um, three districts every year. I know it's a full IT, but it's also you look at the cybersecurity part of it too, right, in those, or do you not? I, I'm actually not on that team, so um, I can give you kind of a brief idea. When they do those audits, um, of course, they're looking at one district at a time where we looked at everybody, and so it is a much deeper dive, um, and they look at much more specific information. We asked about kind of general basic controls. They get in much more deeply to see uh, at the nuances of what exactly the district is doing and where those 
weaknesses might be in that district. And so um, I'm sure, as you've noticed, when they release those audits, they're released in executive session because uh, there is a whole lot more detail about the specifics of what's going on in that district. So. Right, right. Um, just one last question, and then I'll go to Senator Tyson. Um, 50, about 50% or a little over 50% um, of the districts responded. Do you have a breakdown of, of that as far as what we would consider high, medium, or large, medium, and small districts? In terms of who, in terms of who responded? Right. Uh, not off the top of my head, but I think that is something we, we can, I can go back and look at our work papers and see if that's something I can get you. That'd be interesting. Thank you. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I know this audit's been out there for a little bit, but um, it, it is very concerning at the results of it and the fact that our schools weren't taking a proactive approach in protecting the data because some of the data that they have nowadays is very concerning as to not just test scores and records on the students, but also health information and other information that is very private and it should be a priority. It's very disappointing that the legislature should have to come in and recommend this kind of security for that data. Um, it's nothing against you guys in the report. What's scary is the fact that this was such a high level audit and less than, you know, not all, even three fourths of schools responded and this is the kind of results we got. So I'm just assuming it's worse for the schools that didn't respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and that's a good point, because we've heard over and over, and, and yeah, a lot of it's been in executive session, but still we've heard over and over from school districts that part of their issue is lack of, of support from um, the Department of Education. And so I was hoping that they would step in. And, and so, you know, I really think that when we do our recommendations, I'm sure we're not the only committee that is going to put this in a recommendation, but I think it's something that we need to, to put in because it is something that if they're not going to do it voluntarily, we need to put some sort of teeth into the legislation to say they need to do it as far as um, some oversight from KSD. So any other questions? All right. Thank you, Holly. Or Heidi, I'm sorry, Heidi. <laughs> All right, now we're going to go to uh, Matt Edsel is going to uh, give us the unemployment insurance fraud audit that was done several months ago here now. So, Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Edsel. I'll be presenting the findings from our audit that looked at the Department of Labor's response to processing unemployment claims during the pandemic. Uh, as a reminder, this is part two of our two-part audit. Um, part two really evaluated the main causes for delays in claims processing during the pandemic, uh, and it also included an updated, uh, more detailed estimate on how much unemployment fraud uh, could have occurred in Kansas over the course of the pandemic. Uh, so those are the two topics I'm going to be covering today. Uh, before I jump into those findings, just a brief refresher on the state's regular unemployment program and those temporary federal unemployment programs. Uh, so, of course, the Kansas Department of Labor oversees the state's regular unemployment insurance program. Regular unemployment gives financial assistance to people that lost their job for certain qualifying reasons. Uh, traditionally, regular unemployment is funded entirely by state employers, uh, and those funds are deposited and kept in the state's unemployment trust fund. Then, of course, in 2020, the federal government created uh, some temporary unemployment programs to help people who lost their job because of COVID-19. Um, these programs were funded entirely with federal CARES Act funds, so they didn't impact the balance of the state's unemployment trust fund. Um, these programs were temporary, and they did expire this past September. So, as I'm sure you're aware, there were significant delays in claims processing over the course of the pandemic. Uh, that was true nationally as well as in Kansas. Um, so again, one of our main objectives in this audit was to determine kind of what, what caused those delays in Kansas. Uh, what we ended up finding was that it was really a combination of, of three things. Um, rapid changes to the state's unemployment program, historically high unemployment claims, and an ill-equipped computer processing system. So I'll briefly walk you through those findings in a little bit more detail and then move on to our fraud findings. But 
Um, the timeliness piece, those findings really start on page five of the report. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, states use large and powerful computer systems to help process unemployment claims. Those computers, of course, run on a significant amount of computer code. Um, like a lot of states, Kansas's unemployment system, processing system, um, is centered around a mainframe computer that operates on an outdated coding language from the 1970s. What's happened is that over time, Cadal had to add more modern programs and systems around that outdated mainframe. Uh, and modern programs don't always integrate very well with that mainframe. Um, and that's because they're really running on two different languages, um, one modern, one outdated. Um, so what Cadal ended up with is this kind of piecemeal processing system made up of newer and older technologies uh, that at times can really struggle to work well together. Um, and that's especially true during periods of high claims volume, which is exactly what happened, of course, during the pandemic. Um, so figure two on page nine of the report shows that claims increased significantly from about 3,000 claims in February 2020 to around 66,000 just a month later by March. And you can see that remains relatively high over the course of the pandemic. That, that increase put a lot of stress on that piecemealed system and that caused it to break down periodically. Uh, and when it was down or it wasn't functioning properly, claims weren't getting processed during that time, which caused those delays in people getting their payments. One of the other main issues that we found with this system was not only was the mainframe's code outdated, uh, it was also fairly disorganized. Um, what happened was that historically, KDAL staff weren't following a uniform or well-documented process uh, when they were making changes to the mainframe's code. Um, and that's risky, right? Because uh, especially as you continue to modify that code, because what happens is it becomes so disorganized it gets to the point where you can't really be sure what effect new changes will have on the overall system. Now, during the pandemic, the US Department of Labor was handing down a lot of changes to states' unemployment systems, and that required Cadal to continuously modify that mainframe code. So what happened is, in some cases, those changes had a really bad interaction with that disorganized code, and it created errors on people's claims. So Cadal showed us one example where a coding error made it appear that several people were no longer eligible for benefits, despite still having multiple weeks of eligibility left. Uh, and unfortunately, these errors, they're not easy to see, um, and they're not easy to fix. Uh, you need specialized staff to review the claims and identify the issue, and you need specialized IT staff familiar with that outdated code to go in and actually fix that issue. Um, so unfortunately, uh, these aren't always quick fixes, uh, and during those times, people were, again, going without benefits. So uh, as I'm sure you know, Cadal has started the process of modernizing its computer processing system, which if successful, we do think could help address some of these issues that caused those delays in processing during the pandemic. So for the sake of time, I do wanna move on to our fraud estimate though, which begins on page 13 of the report. Uh, just as a quick reminder, um, in February of this year, we reported a preliminary estimate of about $600 million in potential unemployment fraud in Kansas in 2020. Uh, that was a very high level estimate with the intent of giving um, some idea of how much fraud was occurring while we continued to work through KDAL's claims data to produce a more accurate, more detailed fraud estimate, which is what I'm going to be presenting today. So for this estimate, we use something called a neural network, which is a form of machine learning to help us identify suspicious claims that could be cases of imposter fraud. Um, without going into too much detail, uh, basically we started by manually reviewing a sample of 1,000 claims applications. And for each of those claims, we looked at 26 things that could, be, that could really indicate uh, cases of imposter fraud. So for example, we looked to see how many times the same kind of complex password was used uh, across uh, multiple unique claims. The likelihood that that happened by chance are extremely low. So when we see that show up and show up in, in really large numbers, that's a really good indication to us that fraud might be occurring. So then using those the results of those 1,000 claims, we trained the neural network to replicate our decision-making patterns. And once that network was trained, uh, it could really make those same decisions that we did 
on all the remaining unique claims from January 2020 through February 2021, which was a little over 1 million claims. So this really helped us kind of automate our fraud review process across the entire population uh, of unique claimants during that time. Um, one quick note, our neural network was really only looking for those cases of imposter fraud, so basically fraud via identity theft. So it would not have picked up on other cases like improper payments or wage fraud or false employer fraud. Uh, but with that in mind, uh, we now estimate about $700 million in unemployment fraud could have occurred in Kansas between January 2020 and February 2021. Ultimately, our fraud estimate is really a combination of two things, the result of that neural network uh, and claims that KDAL had already flagged as fraud in its data. Um, and that breakdown is shown in figure four on page 15 of the report. So kind of starting from left to right in that figure, uh, you can see that there's about $71 million in fraud that our neural network picked up that was not in KDAL's, not flagged as fraud in KDAL's data. Then in that middle section, there's $309 million um, that was flagged by both our neural network and in KDAL's data. So that's kind of where our analyses overlap. And then on the far right, there is $306 million in fraud that was flagged by KDAL, but not our neural network. Right? So, and there's a, a few reasons for that. Um, one, our neural network, again, was really trained to pick up on imposter fraud. So there were likely some cases, again, of wage fraud, false employer fraud, um, that KDAL could have flagged that we didn't. Um, KDAL also brought to our attention that some of that $306 million could have actually been legitimate claims that they incorrectly flagged as fraud over the course of the pandemic. Um, we acknowledge that's possible, uh, but there really wasn't any way for KDAL or for us to verify how much of that $306 million could have been legitimate claims at that time. That would really uh, take a detailed investigation by KDAL to go and claim by claim and do a, kind of a forensic investigation to determine how many of those were legitimate and how many of those were potentially fraudulent. So uh, we do list that as a risk along with some other possible limitations to our estimate, uh, which are listed on page 16 of the report if you'd like more detail on those. Uh, I'd also like to highlight figure five, which is on page 18 of the report. Um, this is a breakdown of our $700 million fraud estimate by state and federal unemployment programs over the course of the pandemic. What we ended up finding was that of that $700 million estimate, about half, so $343 million, uh, came from federal unemployment funds, and about half, $344 million, uh, actually came from state unemployment funds. So, it was pretty evenly split as far as total dollar amounts over that time, but where we saw differences really when that fraud occurred. Uh, so uh, as you can see in that figure, fraud from the federal programs, which is that orange line, uh, really occurred earlier in the pandemic, peaking around July of 2020 before starting to decline, where fraud in the state's unemployment program, the regular unemployment program, really started to increase around October 2020 peaking late in uh, the winter before declining significantly around February 2021, which coincides to when KDAL uh, implemented their identity verification system, which seems to have um, prevented a lot of those fraudulent attempts from going through. Um, the, the last thing I'd like to cover, and then I'd be happy to stand for questions or elaborate on any of the findings, is uh, fraud prevention. Um, and those findings are summarized in figure, <clears throat> excuse me, figure six on page 19 of the report. As that figure shows, we found that a significant number of all the claims filed during the pandemic, about 59% of them, were attempts to commit fraud. Um, that being said, we found that about 30% of those attempts were actually paid. So what that means is that about 70% of all fraudulent attempts that occurred during this time period uh, were, were not paid, they were prevented from being paid out. So we wanted to try to also provide an estimate on the value of these fraudulent claims that were prevented. Uh, so using some averages of claims paid during this time, we estimated that there's about $2 billion in potential fraudulent payments that were prevented in Kansas, also prevented in Kansas during the course of the pandemic. So it's kind of a high level summarization of our findings from part two um, and our, our new uh, detailed fraud estimate. I'm happy to elaborate on any of the findings or stand for any questions the committee might have. Committee, any questions? Yeah, Representative Collins. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as far as the fraud, um, and I understand most of it probably came from outside the country, so uh, there's probably not much we can do about that. But uh, is there any uh, attempt to prosecute anyone for any of that? And like I said, I know, uh, I mean, uh, that massive amount, I know it would be hard to do. And like I said, probably most of it came from overseas, but I was just wondering if there's any, any steps uh, prosecute at federal level there's been a few cases it seems where cases have been investigated and there's potential for prosecution in kansas specifically i'm not sure at the time the audit ended what i can say is that the two the two banks that the state works with i think bank of america and u.s bank one of them had flagged uh some payments that seemed suspicious uh and were holding them so i think they reported about 7.4 million in potentially fraudulent payments that I think the state could recoup from Bank of America, at least time of this audit. Cadol had confirmed about 3.9 million of that total. Uh, that actually could have been fraudulent. Of that 7.4, they had confirmed about 3.9 million. That's potential for being recouped. Um, that's not necessarily a prosecution, but you know, it's it's the potential to get some money back. Thank you. And I do just want to add that, um, as far as legitimate claims, that uh, I'm still hearing from people who whose accounts were flagged and uh, they're having problems collecting because uh, I just want to say I, I'm still hearing from people who are in that situation. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Yeah. Representative Amex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Matt, question. Um, $700 million were the claims. All of this money went to addresses or to bank accounts or to someplace. At what point does a computer shut it down that it won't send it to the same address or to the same bank account over and over and over again? I think it would have to be flagged in KDAL's system as, as fraudulent in order for the, the payment to stop uh, continuing to go to that bank account or that address. So something would have to flag it in KDAL's system for it to stop payment. And do we today, with some of the things that KDAL is doing, is, is that going to be stopped? You know, when we when we evaluated Cadel's controls, one of the one of the big things that we saw was that identity verification system going into place in February. So it was more what we saw was more on the front end. So preventing the claims from ever getting paid out in the first place. So when people try to apply in other people's identities, those claims stop. Um, we didn't do a, a detailed evaluation in part two of the controls on the back side of that. So once they once the claim gets approved what processes are in place now to basically stop those. So that's, I know they said that they're in the process of updating that in their systems, but we didn't follow up with that necessarily in, in part two of this audit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I think some of the, um, without saying too much, most of the, of the vendors that, that would be looked at for modernization would have some of that um, back, back office ability to to uh, kind of flag some of those multiple um, going to the same you know going to the same address or going to the same bank account or things like that that our current system just can't do so uh, Senator Pittman thank you mr. chair and thanks for that great presentation Matt um, I, I'm going to emphasize this committee that you got a couple members that are on the unemployment um, Modernization Committee. We've gone into a lot of these kind of questions and a lot of, you know, had, obviously this is a terrible travesty that's happened in Kansas and has happened across the, the many different states. Um, and we asked the same kind of questions as Senator Amos, Senator Collins, and, you know, tons more as well, uh, asking the obvious questions of if there's an identified bank account, can we get to that? And there are ways that we have been able to get to that and shut some of those things down. And that's a good thing. If you notice on that graph on page 18, it tells a big story um, that this post audit crew was looking at was how much during that one time period. And you'll see uh, that the state funds in December and January, 107, 100 million in terms of estimates, there were a lot of uh, fraud attempts going on straight into the businesses, right? And so when he talks about identity management, we didn't have a system where if somebody had to come in and identify themselves first and then put the fraud claim in, they could just put fraud claims and then put random names out there and just go fishing for whatever. So there was a huge, huge attempt. 
And that's when we all heard, all of us heard from all those business owners who were so disappointed to hear all that. And that's when really people started really getting angry and, and the identity management system came in and clamped that down, which is a good thing. Um, we do have, I think you guys probably know, as a legislative body, we put in place the statutory requirement to go out and look further than this audit goes. And we contracting, we're in the process of contracting a firm, one among six that applied, to look into just how much fraud occurred, how does that validate against what the LPA has put in place, and then extend that out into the future horizon. And I forget how far it goes, but it goes through this year and I think even into the next. So there's gonna be a bigger picture from a firm that's gonna to go to a level deeper than what the post audit folks were able to even do. They came up, they presented a lot of options, and there is a cost to us to do that, but I think it's important because it's gonna feed in, as the chairman said, into how we strategize on the new system and what really needs to put in place both here and then taking advantage of some of the stuff in, uh, that other states are doing. I will emphasize on page 15, we, we have an estimate of 309 that are high confident or identified um, uh, fraud by the Department of Labor. But even then, to Senator Collins' point, there's a lot of folks that were flagged as fraud that we know that they weren't in the fraudulent condition. And I think he points that out, that in that circumstance, we could be overestimating even in, in the ones that are of a high confidence. And that in the, um, the, the less lower confidence of the 306, that that's also a, um, a potential that was identified by the neural network. And I appreciate you going through that. It is an estimate. You know, our portion of this is, a, is about half of what we're showing here, right? The state's portion of the fraud that you're estimating is about half of that. Um, so I mean, this is a big problem. I, I think it highlights the discussion we're gonna talk about in a little, little later um, in terms of risk-based projects. If we don't fix this, it's a very, very high risk to the state, and this is what we're talking about. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I am disappointed that this got to this point, obviously. Let's put that out there. Thanks for the study, and I, I can't wait to hear from the fraudulent detection unit that we put in place, how it corresponds to this, and uh, I'm sure it's going to tell a similar story, and we're going to get some different numbers, given that it's going to be a bigger sample than just a 1,000, but I uh, appreciate you putting these things out here. Thanks. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the comments of the previous uh, senator. I have a couple of questions. One is we've been told that the department was warned in March of fraudulent activity to increase and that they didn't implement anything until the previous or to, till the next February, almost a year later. Could some of this been avoided? And also on the fraudulent claims, these are the only ones that we know that were fraud. Excuse me. Some of them could have been paid out and were not flagged as fraud. And we would have no idea how high that number is, would we, at this point? So that, maybe to answer your, your second question first, the, that there, yeah, there is a possibility, and that's one of our limitations as well, right? So that there's possible that fraud occurred that neither our model nor Cato had picked up on as well. So that would actually cause our estimate to be understated to some degree. Limitations that could cause it to be overstated, limitations that could cause it to be understated. So those, those are definitely in there. Uh, to answer your first question, I'm not sure why it took Cato as long as it did to you know get the identity verification system in place in in February, but I don't know if anybody if there's representatives from Cato here today that maybe can no. we certainly we could follow up on that because it, according to this graph, much of this could have been avoided if it would have been implemented just four months quicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Yeah, and so we might have, um, James, if we could get maybe a response from KDAL and, and just uh, disseminate that to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Just to clarify, you're looking for a response from KDAL regarding um, why it took from March of 2020 to February of 21 to implement the identification um, component to that? Yes, that would be the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I understand that they're going to have um, excuses and priorities, but security is always a priority, as this committee knows. And we need to convey that to the rest of government, that 
security needs to be a priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think this is a, uh, you know, of course, Cato deals with, especially since the, with the pandemic, they dealt with a huge number of influx of, of uh, people. But I think this is a good reminder of why we need our systems to be up to date and working properly throughout, throughout of all the government, <laughs> because we do hold a lot of sensitive information. And if we're not on top of the IT security of, of this information, it can certainly um, get into the wrong hands. So um, any other questions? OK. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right. All right, so for the, the uh, next presentation, we're going to go into executive session. So I'll have the vice chair read, um, uh, make the motion for us to go into executive session. Yeah, I think we had an hour. Yeah, so we're going to we're going to go into executive session for an around an hour, twenty minutes per um, presentation, and then there'll be a little bit of time period between as people um, shuffle in and out. So those that are um, involved in the different so we have Wichita State, Department of Revenue, and Kansas Gaming and Racing. So as as we go through the different ones, and we'll have a little bit of time where people come in and out, and um, so. Also, a reminder that we will we will not be um, online during this time. So anyone who is online will not be um, participating in the executive session. And uh, so, with that, we'll call for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the open meeting of the Joint Committee on Information Technology in Room 582 North of the State House be recessed for a closed executive meeting to commence immediately in Room 112 North of the State House pursuant to KSA 2021-754319B12C for discussion of the security of information systems with individuals from the Legislative Division of Post Office, Office of Information. Technology Services and Department of Revenue, Kansas Racing and Gaming Commission, which is subject under consideration by the Joint Committee on Information of Technology because open discussion would jeopardize the security of the information system. The Joint Committee on Information and Technology resumed the open meeting in room 582 north of the State House at 11 a.m. and that this motion, if adopted, be recorded in the minutes of the Joint Committee on Information and Technology and be maintained as part of the permanent records of the committee. Second by Senator Tyson. Did you have a, Senator Tyson, did you have a question? Point of order. Oh, okay. Clarification, the first room number was one, and the second with Senator, it, he had the correct room number. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's I 582. Wrong on the document. Okay. Thank you. I'll make sure we. All right, it stands corrected as it was 582 North. I read the 112. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. What's going on in this room? Okay, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Senator Tyson seconds. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Okay, we are now going into executive session.
All right, there we are. All right, committee, we're going to come back into order um, for our next presentation. Actually, let me go back. Let's before we so I don't forget this. Um, has everyone had a chance to uh, review the August nineteenth meeting uh, minutes? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve or any changes? Uh, Senator Tyson makes a motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Curtis. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. So we got our mission, uh, the minutes approved. All right. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a presentation on data centric security for the public sector um, by uh, WWT, uh, Worldwide Technology. They're going to actually, they were going to do it in person and then when um, when I had to uh, um, postpone the meeting, um, it didn't work out for them to be here in person this for this time, but they're going to do it online. But we do have um, um, good grief. John Monroe. I'm sorry, John. I just said hi to you, and then I blanked out. Uh, John Monroe, who, who represents them, are, uh, he is uh, uh, with us today, but they're going to uh, present to us online. So if we can go ahead and... Start that to make that happen. Okay. So John John Evans. Hello, committee members. You've got uh, Ian Hilton here with uh, Worldwide Technology. I think John is connecting. We just uh, hung up a call where we were talking amongst ourselves, so he should be online here in one moment. But uh, really appreciate the time today. Like I said, Ian Hilton. Uh, I am a uh, account executive with Worldwide Technology and manage all of the relationships across the state of Kansas, um, you know, and the engagements that we have uh, with, with a number of your uh, local entities and state agencies. So I am also joined uh, by Michael Gallagher. Uh, Michael, will introduce yourself here. Hey, team. Um, thanks for inviting us. We're excited about uh, providing some insight here. Um, I spent 26 years with a large consulting firm called Accenture. I ran the office the past 12 years and uh, look forward to uh, hearing um, more on the topic. Yep. And uh, we are, hold on one second, we're going to bring in John Evans here. All right, we've also got John Evans online. John, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm John Evans, Chief Technology Advisor with Worldwide Tech Technology. Been with Worldwide for uh, about two years now. Just celebrated my two-year anniversary with them, actually. Um, just prior to that, I was the CISO for the state of Maryland. Um, and then going back in my career, um, was mostly Department of Defense and Intelligence Community working cybersecurity for companies like uh, North, North of Grumman and MITRE. So, John, I think we are live. What I'm going to do uh, is I will get you over the WebEx link, John. I don't know if you have anything to share. If you want to email it to me direct, I can kind of uh, be your proxy and throw it up on the screen. But uh, uh, we, we might also be joined, uh, members of the committee, just as an FYI, by Stephen Meyer, who is the former Chief Information Security Officer at the state of Missouri. Uh, he just recently left the state and uh, has joined worldwide to help us in our cyber practice. Uh, so he may or may not be coming online, but uh, John uh, is going to uh, provide our testimony today and, and uh, be our subject matter expert here to, uh, to talk all things cyber. So, John, I'll kick it over to you and take us away. Ian, all right, thank you. Before you, before you start, can I clarify, are the other two conferenced in with you, and so they're not on a separate account, so they're not going to show up on our video? Is that correct? Or that they is correct. Yeah, I've got John on audio here. I just okay. uh, pulled him in my audio line. I'm going to send the. There were some problems with WebEx. They weren't able to get in. So I, I'm the only one that was able to get into the WebEx. Um, but I'm going to forward the link to them right now. So they may or may not be hopping on the WebEx once they get the link. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It looks like go Steve ahead. On. So Steve is here as well. Okay. All right, I am ahead. planning to jump on. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I am planning to jump on as soon as I get. The link for whatever reason the link wasn't working for me i don't know if it was partial or what but uh as soon as i get the good link i'll jump on um 
and then in case there are any requests for me to share any information, anything like 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 that, I'll be able to do so. So, um, but I don't want to necessarily uh, wait for that delay anything. Delay anything. I know we're a limited, uh, a little bit limited on time. So, um, figure I'll jump into it, and uh, you know, until I get the link, I won't be able to to see anybody raising their 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 hand, either you know, physically or the little icon. So, just feel free to please jump in and. I won't be offended. I promise. If uh, you know, if it, if anybody interrupts, so um, you know, want to want to keep it as a dialogue if if we can possibly. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I uh, figured I'd start off. Um, read a couple interesting reports um, out of the state re recently. One of them was a legislature's nonpartisan report came out of the auditing department. Uh, it was around school districts. Um, about half of the school districts uh, that, that were cited in the report didn't have a response plan in the attack in the event of a cyber attack and uh, just seemed, you know, um, maybe not up to up to par in terms of their overall uh, cyber cap cap capabilities. Um, thought that tied pretty directly in with a FBI and Department of Homeland Security joint report that was published uh, recently, a couple months ago, I believe that listed out those cyber issues and events that are most impactful to K through 12 schools. And it got me thinking because those issues and events that are most impactful to K through 12 schools are not very different from what we see as those most impactful things um, across state and local government and education. And a lot of them also tie to the uh, cyber committee re re report the recommendations um, that, that were recently issued um, out of out of the governor's office, I believe it was. So, uh, figured I'd jump into that a little bit. You know, a, a, as I kind of mentioned, there was about half of them surveyed that that didn't have a response plan. Um, and uh, even going beyond that, if we look at the report that came out of the cyber committee, it, one of the recommendations in there is to have a cyber incident and disruption response plan um, and make sure that it's maintained. Uh, as 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 a part of the the, the state of Kansas free free response plan, um, and there's a lot of good information I would say in the incident response section in general, especially around the collaboration and information and information sharing places. Um, but this this type of recommendation, the recommendation just to have a plan here, you know, um, it it falls behind what is actually needed. Um, I, I'll, I'll give a, a, a quick story. I was um, the state of Maryland CISO when the Baltimore the Baltimore ransomware attack happened two years ago, uh, 2019. And um, you know there was a couple reasons that I'll I'll kind of touch on why things went so 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 badly with that and end up costing tens of millions of dollars to uh, remediate um, that that issue. But one of the main things was you know. When you look at a defense in depth strat strategy, it's almost assumed in a lot of cases that bad guys, if they try hard enough, they're going to be able to get in. So I have to be able to recover to be able to to respond once they do get in. And just having a plan for how I'm going to recover, Baltimore City had a plan, but it proved to be woefully inadequate. And this was shown in the city of Atlanta. It's, it's been it's been multiple places across the country, all of them resulting in tens of millions of dollars to to remediate to fix um, what we've really learned is that you can't just have a plan you have to test the plan you have to run tabletop exercises you have to make sure that your plan actually works in Baltimore City for instance it was sort of an approach where hey the amount of data that we have in our live production environment actually you know matches the amount that's being backed up therefore it must all be there it must all be good um, but it was never actually tested and that you know, it proved to not be the case that it was able to be recovered in an in adequate fashion. So just having a plan, just looking at at the um, at things without actually test testing them, um, not adequate. So and 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 it, and it can be tough with limited resources. Totally get that, but it's absolutely needed. So um, and there is some of that type of language in the uh, the 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 Cyber Commission's report. Um, in terms of long-term goals, but it's not in the short-term goals. And you know, as as we've seen multiple times now, it's something that needs to be addressed sooner. So, 
Um, that's something where I would recommend maybe taking that a step further than what it's currently being being looked at in 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 the short term. Maybe have have discussions around actually ex, ex extending that to be um, tested um, at least tabletop exercises where you run through actual scenarios rather than just having a uh, plan. So. Um, you know, both for the state agencies as well as for for the school districts, you know, have have that type of of a of an ideal place in mind for 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 where to, for where you're trying to go, um, and you know, there's there's no reason that I that I would well I shouldn't say it like that there there are, there are reasons uh, why it could be difficult to enact a a single standard across the state, but uh, it may be, be beneficial to look at, um, you know, having some sort of single single governance model, single single standard that that would apply to not just state agencies, but also apply to to to, to state and local. It was um, South Dakota, I believe, that was one of the first states to come up with this type of model, where basically anybody who's running on um, you know, share, sharing information with with state entities or running on state services such as the state backbone, the state the state fiber, would have to adhere to this minimum set of requirements. And one of those would have been a um, um, you know, testing backups, tabletop exercises, those sorts of things. So, um, if I if if I look at the report that was issued by Homeland Security and the FBI, those those top things, if I kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll combine a few of them here, but we've got ransomware and malware. We've got distributed denial of, of service attacks, video conferencing disruptions, social engineering, vulnerability management, and exposed and open ports, which you could put as a, as a subset of vulnerability management. So to me, this ties into one of the other, one of the other recommendations that was made um, in the in the report, which was uh, the, the the one the um, the cyber council report, which was to conduct a state assessment or landscape analysis of the current cybersecurity capabilities and posture of Kansas. And I would say that this combined with my recommendations around the um, incident response and disruption plan would be the two most important recommendations probably coming out of that report. And that, that directly ties into what I was saying about the top six or seven areas, depending on how you look at it, uh, that were included in the FBI and Department of Homeland Security report as those issues that were most impactful um, to to um, to some local state um, entities. So, if 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 we were to um, pull that thread a little bit and say these are the Six or seven things that I need to make sure that everybody's doing really, really well, and we know that this is, or at least you know, cited by um, FBI and Homeland Security as as some of the the major issues that our 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 agencies, our our, our state organizations may may be facing. Um, you know, would it be worth looking at some sort of common governance structure that would at least address those? Common items, um, and you know, I I've seen some some statistics that that would cut uh, cyber attacks by something like eighty something per, per per percent if we could at least do those kind of very foundational things. So if you think about it in like a, a crawl, walk, run type of structure, um, at least get everybody at that at that you know common level, the uh, crawl level, maybe at 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 the very least. Um, some sort of common governance structure to make sure that everyone's adhering to to common standards and implementation guidelines around each of those areas that's been cited as one of the most 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 impactful areas. I think that that would be uh, something that might be worth discussing. And happy to to go into that more. Or if I'm uh, if I'm diving in too technical in any area, please let me know, and I'll I'll definitely bring it back up, trying to hit it from multiple levels here. You want to pause there, John, and see if there are any questions from the team and the group? Absolutely. Committee, any questions so far? Yep, Senator Pittman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, John, for presenting. Um, uh, just two questions. Did you happen to present? Uh, I, I, wasn't on, I wasn't on all the subcommittees on the Joint 
Task Force on uh, Cybersecurity here in the state. Did you happen to get invited to uh, participate in that? Uh, we I had did a, not. I don't know if you knew anything about it, but we had a cybersecurity task force set up. Um, and I love hearing from professionals like yourself who've worked with uh, state governments as well as cyber stuff. So um, maybe that's something that we can continue to, to bring you into that group as well. I, I honestly... Those are all good suggestions, and I think there's a lot of people focused on that. Um, we're not nearly as far down the road as we need to be with a lot of those kind of standardizations that you've talked about. And this is probably an unfair question, so if you don't feel like answering it, it's okay. But you know, you, you worked at the state of Maryland, and um, you know, they, we've gone come come out of a lot of fraud, and we were just talking about fraud, so it's a really hot topic on our minds for the last few months. How did Maryland State? How did they fare? during this whole pandemic with the unemployment, given that, I mean, you were the CISO and CTO for a while. So I, yeah, that's why I'm saying, if you don't want to comment on it, you don't need to take any cre credit or, uh, or, or any kind of uh, hate for that. But I was just wondering, how did they fare with the unemployment fraud? And given what you know about their cybersecurity, did it help or hurt them? Now, you know, the kind of policies that they had in place. Maybe it was a while back, and then you don't know, but so I'm just putting that question out there if you want to answer it. Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be happy to. It's a great question. Um, and, to, and I'll be totally honest. I'm probably not as well equipped to answer the question specific to unemployment in, insurance uh, fraud, but I could probably answer a little bit better around things like, um, um, you know, more in the health and human services space. So uh, uh, Medicaid fraud, um, um, SNAP, TANF, those types of, of of frauds. We, you know, there there was an uptick in 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 those areas also in uh, COVID, um, and I'm probably more suited to speak around those areas because I was sure. more directly hands on with building out those systems. Would you be interested in hearing that, or would you like me to? Is that okay, stick to your question? Yeah, I'd love to uh, love to hear about any kind of perspective on that kind of topic uh, and, and that particular example. Yeah, that'd be great. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the health and human services space, it was actually, it was a little bit of our cybersecurity, um, you know, structures that we had in, 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 in place. But one of the big tools that we had that really enabled us to cut down on fraud, waste, and abuse um, around those other programs that I that I, that I mentioned, was we had recently invested um, quite a bit of time, effort, money in a back-end data system that all of Health and Human Services was starting to be onboarded on in a in a incremental fashion, um, where we basically we broke down the data silos across the different departments. So we had a common data repository on the back end. And then we had role-based, rule-based access for who was able to access what type of, 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 of information in that common repository. But what it allowed us to do was it allowed us to track individuals or to um, identify individuals as they moved between a lot of the different services that, that, that the state offers. So um, one of the examples that we, that we realized, and this isn't exactly around fraud, waste, and abuse, but I think it'll you know, help illustrate the uh, point, point a little bit. Um, you know, we noticed that we had people who were getting out of Department of Health services around rehab services, and then when they got out, there was no communication really happening, or there was, a lot of times was insufficient communication happening between our Department of, of uh, uh, Housing and Community Development and Department of Health. So there may not be a bed waiting for these individuals when they got out of rehab or some sort of of a half, halfway housing or something like that. So uh, we had people getting out of, of rehab services who now were left without a place to stay, it's not hard to imagine that they're back on the street around the same people that they were using around um, in, you know, in, in their previous times. And um, the, uh, the recidivism rates and, um, you know, um, um, you know uh, the, 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 the rates that people were getting re-addicted re, re uh, was, was pushed up, we thought, by 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 some of this inability to uh, communicate and identify a common person across different uh, different agencies. It's just one example, but it also really helped with our fraud, waste, and abuse. Being able to say, you know, um, this person should no longer be receiving. Back to the rehab example, this person should no longer be receiving SNAP TANF benefits because 
they're in a rehab facility where they're they're housing their um, um, uh, food is 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 already being supplemented through through another program. Um, so, real, so really, kind of an identity management solution, not just identity yeah. checking with a verification with let's say ID licenses, but really an identity management system that could be tapped into across all applications, at least in this sphere, in terms of the health and human services. You're saying that you you basically built this thing out, and then an application could could use that to identify the, that there it was an actual person there, and it wouldn't necessarily be siloed information system by system, right? Yes, sir. You're 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 spot on. We called it our uh, master data management identity system, but you're you're spot on. It it was you know, um, it it provided better outcomes for the constituents. Uh, it provided better reporting to individuals such as yourself in in leadership positions within the uh, state, and it also was able to allow us to cut down on our fraud, fraud, waste, and abuse. You're you're spot on. You got it. How much did that cost to put in place, by chance? Do you have any idea? I mean, it sounds I great. Do. I mean, um, <laughs> it it it, it, <laughs> it, uh, it it requires um, some commitment from the state. Um, now we were able to. Uh, I, I'm, th this is a much deeper dive, probably conversation. If you're interested, I'd be happy to sure, uh, provide it. it. Um, That's not a problem. But, um, but we were able to get because we were we were able to maximize federal funding dollars based on the order that we prioritized a lot of the systems um, and the types of work that we were being done. How we portrayed that to the federal government. Um, you know, so in a, there's an APD process that all states go through. Um, we were able to to get um, about 70% of it funded by the federal government. Um, but, and and I don't know how to break it out exactly from application costs versus the backend data system costs, because we also revamped several of our ap applications. We completely rebuilt our child welfare application. We completely re rebuilt our uh, non-MAGI um, um, or long-term long, long -term care Medicaid, depending on the state, what they call it. We completely rebuilt our our child support system, uh, the, the front end, the application piece, all of these also. But at the end of the day, uh, I think it was about $350 million total to do everything, um, to rebuild the applications as well as do the back end data system. I'd have to dig in and get you better numbers on just how much was spent on the back end data system. Uh, but like it's, I really, said, it's really okay, John. I, I just didn't know if you had a range. And, and obviously, there's a lot of extra costs that would come from uh, tying in with the other applications and getting the framework together and all that stuff that ties together, right? Yeah. yeah no, you're you're spot on. And that and and that was really our sort of all in cost. But like I said, we had um, I think it was like 72 percent of the total cost paid for by the federal government. Um, so the impact to the state wasn't in terms of financials uh, wasn't nearly that that big number that I threw up, but it was still a significant investment of the state. And that was over, oh gosh, about four years. Mitty, any other questions? John, we got about 15 minutes here um, to uh, for the presentation. If if you want to continue on, I'd, I'd, I'd like for you to maybe um, try to conclude. You'd mentioned South Dakota's, you know, what they did with their minimum cyber standards, but um, maybe in, in a conclusion, kind of give us a, an idea of maybe something, our first steps that we, that we maybe need to take in Kansas to, uh, to start um, a better process as you finish up here. Yes, sir. I'd be happy to do that. Um, so um, there's there's a uh, you know a couple things I guess that I would recommend um, as as short term sort of initiatives. Um, one of them I haven't touched on really much at all, but there is a recommendation in the um, in the committee report that said uh, to begin building and establishing formal relationships with local governments K through 12s. Uh, regions, institutions, critical infrastructure, and other partners. I think that's a very important recommendation. That you know, if I was if I was prioritizing some of them, um, I think there's there's three that I would bump up to the top. 
it would be that one pro probably, and I don't, I'm not saying that that's number one, um, but I think that that was another lesson learned that I had coming out of the Baltimore City incident was um, there was a lot of resources who were available to come in and help Baltimore City. I had people on standby um, ready to get in there, but because I didn't have that pre-established relationship with them, they didn't know the quality of my people. They didn't know uh, what my subject matter expertise was. I mean, frankly, they didn't know if I was going to come in and make things worse for them or or make or, or make their lives easier. So without that pre-established relationship, that formal relationship, um, they were behind from the get-go. There was days that that were lost where they could have had, you know, really force multiplier type of help. Um, but because there wasn't that relationship established prior to the to the incident. It it never came, and uh, you know, I'm I'm not saying that that was um, anybody's fault necessarily, but certainly we we recognized room for improvement there. So when I saw that uh, in the in the report, it really kind of struck a nerve with me, and thought yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this one as one of the things I think is probably you know in the most important areas, and then um, you know the the other two I've touched on briefly. Uh, but you know, one of them is that that state assessment. It, you, it's it's really hard to know. Uh, first of all, it's really hard to secure things if you don't know what you have. And there's a lot of agencies, I guarantee you, out there that that don't know um, a lot of what they have riding on their networks. They don't know a lot of the data that they have. And if you ask them why they have that data in their environment, they're not going to be able to tell you why they have that that data. It'll just be sort of a well, that's the way that we always did it. Um, but really, there needs to be some some rigor put into that evaluation. There needs to be some some tough questions asked, like, you know, what are your data retention policies? Are you practicing data minimization strategies? There's 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 no reason for a state agency to be holding on to data past its 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 useful life. At that point, all it's doing is becoming a liability for 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 the state. So. Um, you know, as a part of that of, of that evaluation phase, there needs to be some. Some tough questions asked, and it's it's going to be uncomfortable. Um, you're likely going to find agencies that'll say, "Well, you know, I, yeah, I'm I know I'm running outdated versions of software with multiple vulnerabilities um, associated with this outdated version of software, but I, I I have to because my application won't won't run on 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 a newer OS, as a for instance." Um, I know that that's going to be the uh, case. I, I, it's, it's the case in every state. It was the case in Maryland. Um, but somebody's going to have to make some hard decisions about, like, well, you know, we're going to look at the data here, and we're going to make a risk-based decision about whether or not we're going to allow this application to continue to operate. Um, some people are going to be up, be up, be upset with you as you go through that evaluation phase and say, you know, you have 30 days to get this fixed, or else we got to shut it off because there's just too much risk. To to the to the state systems and network, um, so that's that's number two. Uh, I the the one of the number you know one of the top three things I, I I think you really should be looking at in in short term is is that state state assessment really get a handle on what type of data you have, why it's there, what type of systems are on your network, why they're there. Frankly, um, you know. Um, uh, Take, take just take a look at the overall risk posture. How well do we understand um, what's what's running on the network? Why it's there? Um, it meet our our desired risk posture within the uh, state. So really take a risk based approach. Like I said, going to make people uncomfortable, but I think you got to do it. Um, and I know it's going to make 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 people look. I, I was not people's friends when we were going through that process. <laughs> Um, and then the other one is, is something else I kind of mentioned around the uh, testing of 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 your backups. Um, not sufficient, like I was saying earlier, to just say, "Yep, we have a we have a plan." Um, there's a lot of a, of organizations that get hit that say, "Well, we we had a plan, but um, you know, if you never test it." Then you might as well not even consider that you have a plan. In my opinion, you got to test it. You got to not just assign roles and responsibilities to people, which is one of the other recommendations in the report that I uh, that that I that I was mentioning. But you got to really um, do tabletop exercises. Do 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 walkthroughs. Don't just tell someone this is your role and responsibility. 
set out a real scenario for them. Um, make sure that they understand exactly what they need to do as a part of that role, um, as, as, as a part of their responsibilities. And, and that's going to vary a little bit depending on the type of cyber incident that you may see. So go through multiple tabletop you know, scenarios, maybe do one for a ransomware, maybe do another one for a denial of service attack. So, um, you know, it, I'm not saying you need to be doing 20 of them, but, you know, maybe pick the top three or something like, 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 like that and make sure that everyone's prepared for those. And at least that'll get everyone into the right kind of battle rhythm where if something bad does happen, um, they're not trying to figure it out in the moment. They can rely at least on some past muscle, muscle memory to uh, get them there and actually start taking down some of your systems. Um, you know, do it, do it overnight, do it in a controlled way, but take them down, make sure that they can actually recover back from uh, backups. Obviously have a, you know, a, a failover, a safety, a safety switch, you know, in, in case you can't, but uh, you know, if, if, if Kansas is anything like Maryland, once you start doing that, your 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 uh, backup recovery DR people um, are probably going to sit up and take notice and say, "Oh, we we weren't as well prepared as we thought we were," which is which is a good thing because that's going to get you closer to the right place. Um, so I'll stop there. Those were kind of my top three recommendations, and I think they tie in. And, and I wanted to, I think, show how they tie in with some of the things that are already happening or some of the thoughts that are already happening within the state. Um, and then I can go a little bit more into the South Dakota piece if you would like me to, but it might be a good place to stop. I just kind of threw a lot at you. Any, any, any questions there? Any, anywhere you'd like me to go deeper? Or no, I, I appreciate that. I think that's great. You know, I know that um, being uh, very familiar with with the uh, with ag, you know, the Department of Agriculture does that very thing with. Um, animal and, and um, agriculture disaster scenarios every year they do a um, you know a scenario that they go through to to see if what they got in place is actually um, going to work and it makes sense to do the same thing with our um, cybersecurity. I, I was going to ask on in Maryland when you were doing those evaluations uh, and all that I would assume that that was a since you were the the CISO and the CETO was that an executive branch, um, something the executive branch was doing, or was that le like legislative uh, push, or was it both? It was executive branch only. Now, you're, you're spot on. It was executive branch only. Um, I would have very much welcomed if uh, it could have been sponsored by the legislature in order to extend it out to other areas. Um, unfortunately, it was political, never was able to happen um, with, within the state of Maryland. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to get political at all, but when you've got, you know, a, a, a governor of one party and a legislature that's primarily the other party, some of those types of conversations, I think, are above my uh, pay grade at that, at that point. Um, and, and I don't know what, you know, what all the relationships oh, are in every school. That's fine. That's fine. I just was curious. I mean, it, it it would make sense, though, I th would think that if you could get some legislative um, language behind it where it was more of a law, it would probably be easier to implement um, than just a executive uh, um, something, you know, that the executive branch was trying to do. Uh, that, that was kind of yep. what I was trying to get at. I, I completely agree with everything you just said. <laughs> okay. It wasn't what I was able to do in Maryland, but I, I think you're on the right track, at least in my opinion. I think that that would be excellent. There's, um, you know, um, there's no reason we can't all, you know, kind of kind of raise the water line together. There's no reason we can't all you know, be, be, be more secure. Um, unfortunately, I think politics maybe got in the way of that a little bit in my case. Um, so I was speaking my my experience comes purely from the executive branch. Sure. I appreciate that. Committee, any other questions? No. Okay. Well, if you want to, John, just to uh, finish up with a few more minutes, and we appreciate it. Sure. Um, the only other thing, since you asked me to touch on it, was the South Dakota bill, and that was... Um, in, in their case, they set out the minimum security standards. So like I kind of mentioned the six areas earlier, I think that might be, you know, a reasonable place to start looking at it if, 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 if there was such an inclination. Um, but um, they basically 
in 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 their case, it was state owned um, fiber, if I remember correctly. And the law was essentially that anyone who's running on the state owned fiber or, or I think there was some provision in there around has um, some level of, and I, I don't, I, I couldn't tell you what the exact level of interaction was, but I think there was some level of interaction cited like a real time connection or something like that versus just, you know, sending files in a, in a, in a batch. But I think it was something like if you have a real time connection, you know, with these state agencies, or if you write on the state fiber, um, then you have to meet these minimum set of requirements. Um, you'll have to submit those those uh, in um, uh, for for evaluation, basically showing that you've done some. It it it, it wasn't like the state was going out and doing all the audits on all agencies every year, you know, in order to make sure that they were meeting the law. But there was some self-reporting type of requirements, if I remember correctly. Um, that had to be met along with periodic um, audits from the uh, from the estate. Um, so, it, and if 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 there's one other area actually, which I don't remember seeing it in the um, in the cyber committee's report uh, that that came out of the governor's office, but um, if there's one other area that you know maybe you you might want to consider having a discussion around, uh, maybe vendor risk management. Um, we've seen, like with the solar winds attack, um, you know, vendor risk management is maybe not being as done as as it as it as it can be in general in cybersecurity, and it gets really difficult with within the state because you've got a lot of different standards that are um, potentially being being used. You have audits that are maintained by third parties, such as uh, SOC two audits. They're 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 called. Um, You've got uh, Fed, Fed ramp, and now there's a new initiative called State Ramp, and I think some states are really, uh, at least I, I I I don't know about Kansas, but I know there's been a couple other states that I've talked with, consulted with around how to kind of get their hands around uh, how vendor risk management is going to work for their individual state. So um, I I didn't quite make my top three, but it would be kind of a Number four, if you wanted to talk more more about it, I didn't know if we'd have time today, and I think I'm coming up on time, so here I just tease you a little bit with that. <laughs> All right, I appreciate that. Uh, some very good information, and I I think that uh, I might have uh, James maybe look into that South Dakota law a little bit more, and maybe give us some um, some information on that. So, uh, John and Ian, I appreciate you guys being here today um, and uh, presenting to us. Sorry for the, that we had to postpone um, last time you weren't able to be here in person, but uh, we do appreciate it. And uh, if there's any, Ian, do you have any last words? No, we, we're just very thankful for the time. Uh, you know, we are here to, to lend our uh, support and, uh, you know, John's expertise at, at any moment, anytime. So feel free to to reach out if we could ever be of uh, help or uh, you know value to the state. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity today. And, and, and I'll just add too that um, somebody had mentioned, or I'm sorry, I didn't keep track of everyone's name, and since I didn't have you on camera, I, I apologize. But there was a mention earlier about um, you know maybe introducing me to the cyber task force. Uh, I would love to do that if that's if that's appropriate, if that's something that I that I could do. Um, please uh, you know engage me. Be I would be happy to do it. It sounds very very interesting. Okay, great. Yeah, and we're going to actually have a, um, this, uh, the Chief Information uh, Security Officer is going to actually give us a presentation after lunch on the uh, cybersecurity uh, um, report. So, appreciate that. All right, thank you guys. Thanks for, thanks for um, being with us. Committee, thank we're you. going... Committee, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, break for lunch now, and um, we'll be back at 1 o'clock with um, um, Secretary Burns Wallace is going to give us a report. And, uh, and then, um, like I said, the Cybersecurity Task Force and the Judicial Branch. And then we're going to get into some discussion on uh, possible legislation that we could um, get into. So with that, we are adjourned until 1 o'clock.
There we are. All right. Com Hello? There we are. Okay. Hello, committee. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you can see, we have some, some uh, treats on our desk, and I think uh, Representative uh, Collins would like to address our, the treats that he put on our desk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, but my phone did uh, go off this morning. I, well, actually, it was a voicemail that I thought was uh, muted, and it wasn't. But uh, like I said, I don't know if anyone noticed, but as of protocol and tradition, uh, I uh, got some candy for everyone on the committee who's in, who's in attendance right now. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Chairman, I noticed, and I couldn't focus after that. Oh, is that right? You, yeah, well. No, this, this makes up for it. That's saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for the, for the candy. We appreciate it. All right, we're going to um, go ahead and get started with the uh, Executive Branch IT uh, project updates with uh, Secretary D'Angelo um, Burns-Wallace. And so welcome to the committee. Glad you're here. Good afternoon. It is good to see you all uh, yeah, before this uh, upcoming holiday weekend. Um, I do have uh, a couple of things to cover this afternoon. Uh, and we'll make sure that we uh, stop for questions in between each as they're kind of a little bit distinct. So um, we're going to talk about the three-year IT plans, which each of you should have a copy in front of you, a nice uh, thick copy. Um, there should be, we are also going to talk about the third quarter uh, IT uh, reporting projects. Uh, I'll give a really quick overview of our September ITEC meeting, and then um, we will uh, share uh, just an update around the cybersecurity task force. So with that, I think they are working to pull me up. All right, I'm going to keep going. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right, so the three-year IT plans, um, which is this uh, lovely bound copy that is on each of your tables. Um, we, again this year, uh, just wanted to highlight um, some of our success stories. So the report does start with um, various success stories that agencies of all sizes, uh, cabinet, non-cabinet, regions, OITS, all uh, submitted as part of the report because we do think this is an important part of continuing to tell the story of the impact and the power of IT uh, for the state. Um, you can read more about them. Uh, we mentioned the data center migration and understand that this center migration started in 2017. And as of the end of September, OITS is 100% out of the Landon data center and it was turned back over to D of A on October 1. So I shook my own hand as I handed it from one of my hats to the other. Um, but that facility, we are now tearing it apart and building it back up so that it can be usable office space for state offices. So very excited about that. Um, again, you, you'll see things in there like security updates and um, hardening our posture, remote work resources that, as you can imagine, over the last year have been a critical uh, success story and piece of what many agencies have done. Um, we also, in this last year, um, have been celebrated uh, nationally. And so you'll see that several individuals earned State Scoop 50 award nominations, honoring both projects as well as individual leaders driving government technology and cybersecurity. Um, I myself received the State Leadership of the Year Award. I was one of seven um, that was uh, awarded that award from a State Scoop 50. Uh, also, uh, our, uh, the OITS uh, was honored by CSO 50 uh, for the implementing of our security project. It demonstrated outstanding business value and thought leadership. So this is an important piece because it again begins to show not just internally, but also externally the work that is happening. And that is part of uh, what this three-year report is about. It's about kind of where we are, continuing to assess, but also projecting forward. One of the major challenges we still have, and you'll see in the challenges section, you know, we continue to see, you know, legacy systems, modernization, things of that nature. St IT staffing issues, we're not alone with that. You see those 
all over the region, all over the country. Um, but what I will say is cybersecurity is probably one of those things that um, we're not alone. It's not as if it's something that we have an issue with. It's just a reality that more and more is being sharpening into the forefront as all of us think about the challenges that we are preparing to deal with. So it's not a problem area as much as an area that has a heightened awareness right now. So many of our agencies identified that as kind of top priority leveraging their resources. What I will say is that if you grab your books, and I just want to show one thing when you do go to review the overall reports, um, if you will turn to page 17 in your book, what we did this year, and as you know, each year that I have helped to put this together, we continue to try to refine it to give you all a better picture of what is going on in our IT space, but also to make sure that it is a useful tool for our agencies and our IT professionals. So what we uh, piloted this year with the executive branch agencies is, you'll see on page 17, it is um, kind of the three-year IT plan, and it's kind of like a snapshot dashboard. Right, page 17 kind of walks you through the different pieces of what each what's in the chart. So for instance, it starts on the left with the agency objectives and that is the high level agency objectives. So for um, D of A, it would be D of A's objectives, not the IT objectives, but the entire agency objectives. Then it begins to talk about the agency's capabilities in the next column. And then it moves to the agency's IT strategic actions. And if you can understand how we've built this, it's here's what our agency is doing, here's its capabilities, here how IT overlays into the business operations to help them deliver on those agency objectives. And then what you see to your far right in the diagram is the strategic roadmap. So these are the actual projects and initiatives that are ongoing across the period of time. And it's color coded to match the original agency objective that is in that first column. That's the design of it. The bottom boxes include um, challenges and other things that are needed to be able to do the work that's in that strategic roadmap box. Um, the other two boxes at the bottom are also looking at um, other things that are depend dependencies or risk in relationship to executing that roadmap, and then metrics, KPIs, um, key performance indicators um, that will be used to measure the impact of the action or the initiative. We piloted this with the cabinet agency. So as you go through the book, you'll see one of these for every cabinet agency. We didn't do it with the non-cabinets this year. We wanted to see how it worked, if it was useful. We welcome feedback from you all. We do believe that it will be, and our goal would be by next year that when all of the executive branch agencies submit, that they would have a similar diagram, including the non-cabinets. With that, I will stand for questions around the three-year IT plan. All right, thank you very much. Any questions from anybody? Would you, would you want to, um, I don't know, maybe just grab one of them and kind of go through it? Definitely, let's flip to, I will, um, I'm going to go to the first one. It's the Department of Administration. <laughs> uh, it is on page 27. Um, so just to walk you through, uh, so our agency objectives as the department is outstanding customer service, uh, process improvement, and statutory and regulatory compliance. So that's our first column, right? <laughs> the systems and the, the actions that we are putting in place across these next three years, again, are aligned to move us like to to and through that process. So um, as we look at, for instance, process improvement, and that's one of the ones that I love the most, um, we are implementing different systems like an e-bid system, an electronic bid system for our procurement process. Um, we have instituted uh, electronic document signing across our agency to streamline all of the paperwork you can imagine that moves through D of A from us to other agencies. And we have a lot of that that still moves in hard copy. Um, 
uh, or is going back and forth over email versus when you use a electronic signature system, you know it's date stamped where it goes, where it is. It is then filed and stored and searchable in the future, things of that nature. Um, we just launched uh, for all executive branch agencies a learning and talent management system. And so it is one learning management system platform. So all training, any training that is necessary for all state employees now sits can sit on this learning platform. But additionally, we can tie it to their, uh, their HR record. We can show their training progress. Um, individual agencies can actually build training plans within it. Um, we can track by agency uh, the completion of certain things, which is really important for some of our training, like uh, sexual harassment, uh, discrimination, um, cybersecurity, where we want you know, full compliance and completing those trainings. We have a way now to see all of that at our fingertips through having a statewide learning management system for executive branch employees. The talent management system as a part of this, and a couple of agencies have had this, so please understand that this is not completely brand new for all agencies. Transportation has a long history and an extensive uh, learning management system. What we've done now is we've used that same platform and every executive branch agency will now have access to it at no additional cost. The talent management system part of this is brand new for everyone. <coughs> oh, excuse me. This is the system where annual evaluations will be kept, performance plans, um, any personnel actions. And it'll be in an electronic system where that supervisor and that employee has full access to that. And you can see and track where those things are. Is my position description accurate? Things of that nature. So again, if I look at what my agency goals are process improvement because of who we are as Department of Administration and what we're working on in that strategic roadmap. We're implementing IT systems that help the operations of the Department of Administration improve the processes that we are responsible for delivering to uh, agencies. At the bottom, um, if we follow the green all the way through, key dependencies and risk changes in needs of other agencies. We are highly dependent on other agencies, as you can imagine, that's who we service. So as those needs change in these particular areas, it has a real impact on the implications of the systems that we deliver to them. Um, and so that's why that's in that dependency, dependency area and in that if you follow through the green and then uh, metrics and KPIs for the learning management system, it'll be uh, where we will start by looking at course completion rates. And then for the talent management system, we'll start by looking at performance review completion rates, the percentage of employees that annually get an, a performance review completed in that system and other actions taken. So that's an example of what this chart is designed for. What I can tell you as we worked with every agency's CIO, um, and we did this in a collaborative way. So our CETA sat down with the agency, their CIO and their team, and as we developed this, they sat there and it was a conversation. What are you doing with this? We're looking at documentation. Everyone's pulling different plans, and they talked through it organically. And, and then we worked it back and forth and back and forth, because at the end of the day, I really believe the power of this is also being a tool for each agency, because then many of my CIOs were able to walk into their secretary and say, you, you have all of these great ideas. Can you see there's not you know, all the things that go into that box so that we can operationalize all these great ideas that the agency has from a business process? So it's been a very helpful tool from, from the CIO's perspective that sits in that agency to help their agency business side understand all the competing priorities that they are trying to deliver for them to meet the goals of the agency. So I hope as you all review it, that it is also useful for your purposes because we've already seen the benefits from our side. Great, so just to make sure that I understand the, let's just take the document e-signature. This shows that you started it towards the end of 2021 and have it, and it will be completed 
fully implemented by the little after the middle of 22. Is that, is that what that means? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, um, yes. It's not so, going to stop at the end of 22. No, it's not going to stop. So understand that this is a, um, like an implementation, right? A uh, type of plan, right? When they expect to deploy it. And that one is an interesting one because like, it's one of those that it has started and we're already using it. We just won't have full rollout across all parts of my agency for a number of months. Think about personnel, then think about the Office of Accounts and Reports. Each of them have hundreds of business cases where e-signature could be used. Then think about procurement. So because of the size of our operation, um, it's going to take us multiple months to roll it out because in for e-signature is a great one. You think, oh, you're just moving things through. Well, on the backside, we need to help them build the archives properly, the filing for searchable later. Uh, we look at the necessary needs for uh, disposal of records or the keeping of our records uh, requirements. So there's a lot of build out, and that's why, for instance, something like that, that it's turned on right now. I'm using it, many parts of my agency using it, but in terms of an actual IT project plan, full implementation across my agency is, is about a, maybe about six, seven months. Make sense? It does, thank you. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions from anybody on the IT plan? Okay, I guess not. All right, Always and as it. I said, you'll see those for each cabinet agency. For the non-cabinets, we use the same uh, template as last year. So what you'll see is they have updated. So you'll see anything that is updated in a box. So uh, if you just turn to page like uh, 105, uh, Board of uh, Indigent Defense Services, their updates right, are in a box that says 2021 updates because these were their priorities from the prior year. So that's the, the um, template for the non-cabinet agencies. Again, our goal will be if we believe that this model works, we'll be working with each of them over this next year to help them build similar uh, templates to the one that we have at the cabinet level, right? Thank you. All right. We will move on to the keto quarterly report. And this is our regular quarterly report. As a reminder, um, we this is the report for the quarter, Q3. So this report is from July to September. Um, and the next report comes out in February, which covers the quarter we're currently in. So as always, sometimes there may be things that even the status they were in in Q3 may have already changed by Q4 because we're reporting kind of one quarter behind. So with that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you received a direct link um, from our keto office uh, to the report as always. Uh, so reminder, it looks like this. It's nice and thick, not as thick as the three-year IT plans, but still fairly thick, about 94 pages. Um, in this quarterly report, uh, we see um, 15 active, 20 approved, 9 planned, and 15 complete. Um, and those are just our overall numbers of what's uh, available for reportable. Those break down as, um, in terms of the active projects, 13 are in the executive branch, and 2 are in the region institutions. Um, as always, I focus primarily on the active, but can take questions across any of the categories as uh, we usually do. Um, for those that are in active status, we have four that are in good, one that is in infrastructure good, one that is in caution, four that are in alert, and uh, five that are recast. Um, and that is their current status for this particular uh, quarter. And I'll walk through, um, as we do, the caution and the alert um, projects um, for any questions. Okay. All right. So the one project that we have in caution as of Q3 is an OITS project, uh, CMBD uh, hub integration project. That's a lot of mumble jumbo. When I had to tell my staff, I was like, 
I need a one sentence so that I can explain as clearly as possible to me what this project is. So if you remember about a year ago, we brought in a third, part, third party partner that helped us do an asset inventory of all of our various assets, right? And we talked about the fact that we needed this to be in a system that, it, that is then integrated to the rest of our pieces and that is updatable and all of those things. And it's gonna live and be tied to our ServiceNow product. So this is the replacement of that true asset management system where all of that inventory and those things will live. As we kicked it off, it's a really a short-term project. The whole life of the project, I think, is not even quite six months. So we are about a month off, but because of the length of that project, being a month off puts us in that caution. So we're about a month behind, um, but we are on track to complete it early next year. Um, and so we're still in that range, but just to give you an idea, short time period, you miss a couple of weeks, it pushes you into that caution because you're not completing on time. So that is the one project that is in caution status. And we have the four that are in alert. So I'm gonna read through my notes so that I make sure I'm giving accurate updates. The first is the KBI DNA data bank. The project is about 30% over schedule, um, but the project is 94% complete. Um, the completion of run deliverable and interface um, is the last piece of it, it of this interface is scheduled to be completed on 12, 13, 21. So they're all scheduled. They're a little behind on schedule, but in terms of overall project completion, they're already at 94%. So they're very close to completing. They just slid on their timeline. Um, for this particular project. The KDHE BER database. Um, this project is about, if I'm looking at this, 100% over schedule. So they are completely schedule has shifted, and but they are only at about 10% behind in deliverable completion. Uh, the project began uh, falling behind schedule due to pandemic shutdown, um, both with the state offices and the vendor. The project is actually making good progress each quarter, but with that initial shutdown and this project stopping, it really pushed its schedule. Um, it is, uh, when we got the update, it is still scheduled to be completed in 2021. But remember, when we measure these, we measure them from their original plans and their completion dates, and its schedule is off because of the, the stopping of the project for a period of time, but they've been making good progress. So, I do have the CIO here, if we do, if you all do have additional questions. Okay. Yeah, because, so the, the adjusted, uh, execution end was the first part of November. So are we still there or, or we're past that? So No. Um, <laughs> so a couple of things about this particular project. Um, I would categorize it as 90% in production. I mean, it's multiple modules that get rolled out. Um, the one module that did not go to production in November is a regulated community interface it's a you know website interface, and they requested additional changes to that before we move that particular piece of the portal in production. And it had to do with um, some auto population of fields that you know we can take from the database and pre-populate some of their information. They thought that was valuable enough that they would prefer to continue to file their require paperwork the old way rather than um, have to re-enter stuff uh, through the portal. So um, that's in the latest build, which is scheduled to go into production um, in December, early December, and then then we'll close out the project. I mean, we, um, you know, there was a debate among the staff, should we go ahead and close out the project and then do this change request you know, as the continuing evolution of any application system. And I said, no, until we're 100% with functionality in production, we're still an active project. And I'm happy to stand up and explain why that is. So. Okay, great. It looks like you're going to, it's going to come under budget. 
Yes, yes. And then um, we will leverage that same system next into the Bureau of Water. So we haven't yet filed the project paperwork for that, but um, with the eventual goal that this becomes kind of the operational suite for um, compliance, application, regulatory discussion with our regulated communities for the Bureau of Environmental Remediation, Bureau of Waste Management, Bureau of Water, et cetera. So. Okay, great. So, and it's going to, it's going to just streamline more, more like electronic yeah, I mean, filing it, it does, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it consolidates. Um, so there is a, a functional component at KDHE called the facility profiler. As you can imagine, there are multiple facilities, hundreds, maybe thousands of facilities in the state of Kansas that are regulated by KDHE across, in some cases, multiple bureaus. Uh, maybe they have a present, maybe they're a, um, a, a, a fuel retailer or wholesaler. So they have, that's regulated by the Bureau of Environmental Remediation, but maybe they also have uh, some component where they touch the Bureau of Waste Management or um, even the Bureau of Water if their site happens to be in close or a part of a watershed. And the idea from the department standpoint is we want to be one face to our regulated community. So when you're talking to KDHE, you're talking to who you need to talk to, not, oh, Bureau of BER over here, Bureau of Water over here, and hey, Waste Management, I just talked to somebody from KDHE last week. And this system kind of brings that at that operational level into the IT systems that they interface with. That's great. Thank you. I used to own a gas station, a tire station. <laughs> I may, yeah, so I, you know about I, I do. application. I didn't, I didn't make an inspector very happy one time because I, I just had another inspection and another inspector came and I said, I think I have more inspectors coming than customers. <laughs> Probably wasn't the right thing to say right before they inspected me, but. Uh. Well, in, in that particular system, the tank system as it were, in order to accept fuel deliveries, you have to have an active permit with KDHE. And the way wholesalers check that is by going online to the system to check and see, is your permit active? And if, if it's not, or if the system isn't available, I may get a call it, 9 p.m. on a Friday that, hey, they're going to be out of gas in Valley Falls unless somebody can confirm this. So it's, it's a critical system. We're happy to ever have a new system to perform that function. Okay, great. And thanks for the explanation on where it's at. So any other questions? Okay, thank you. The last two projects that are in alert as of Q3 um, are with the Department of Transportation. The one is a CMS replacement. Um, this project is 30% over schedule. Um, it is in Q3, so I, I just want to restate that, um, slightly behind on the deliverable completions around 70% and then around 14% over the planned resource hours. Um, the project team has completed the July data migration and has resolved many of the initial migration issues. Um, I have additional details, uh, but I also have the CIO here. Um, this project team has determined, and um, there's a, what I will say is there's an anticipation of maybe separating out a piece of this project, as I understand it. And so there may be kind of like as Glenn was saying, sometimes there's like this piece, everything is in this piece we've determined needs something different. And so they're assessing um, the need to uh, maybe pull a piece of it or be a little bit more flexible. But if there are additional questions there, as I said, the CIO is with us. And then the second one, in case you have questions for him across either, is uh, the KDOT EMS, Capital Inventory System Replacement. This project is 15% behind in deliverable completion, 23% behind in task completion, and 34% over the planned resource hours. Um, this project, uh, they uh, potentially will be looking to recast, and I think it may be in my recast queue um, if I haven't moved it through. Um, lots of paper moving these days. So um, I know you potentially have questions for both of these, so I will ask um, our uh, KDOT CIO, Jeff Glenn, to join me. Okay, great. I 
believe we may have talked about the CMS one last time because it's, I mean, it's been so long. Yes, sir, we did. And, and, and I, yeah, I think we did, I'm pretty sure, so. Sure. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions? So I, I guess maybe explain what the secretary was talking about that you're, you're maybe going, are you, are you going to say part of it's completed and then try to recast the rest of it? Is so that the, kind of what you're the, looking at? Uh, yes, sir. The construction management system is is a uh, essentially a 40-year-old mainframe-based system that we're replacing with an Ashtoware product. It, too, has uh, modules, and so we are rolling out through those modules. Um, some are in far greater stages, status of completion than others. Uh, we, are, we are constrained also by the snow and ice season and also our ability to, to execute during the end of the fiscal year. And so that closes the window at which time we can we can go live with this product. So yeah, I think I remember that from last last uh, meeting, you talking about that. Um, but as far as the the cost is the cost is on the cost is is anticipated not to uh, exceed the budget. In fact we'll probably come in below what our, our, our anticipated cost for the project. Okay. So um, it probably says here. So, what do you, what do you estimate that it's completed? What's the the new project timeline completion will be um, no, March of no. I mean, the, I'm sorry. I, I should have. What's your are, are you estimated that it's thirty percent completed or or ninety percent completed as far as all your different modules? It may say it in there somewhere. I don't believe that it does actually. Um, it's very difficult to to. To articulate simply because you know the system touches so many other interfaces, and so um, I'd say that we're probably seventy-five percent complete at this point. Committee, any other questions for either one of the? I guess. Oh, sorry, Senator Peterson. Thank you, but we're still on track to have that completed September twenty twenty-two. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. And maybe just a, a few comments about the the inventory system. Yes, sir. The equipment management system, again, that is replacing roughly a 40-year-old uh, mainframe-based system. Uh, we are going uh, to um, – it, it's behind schedule this uh, this deliverable – or this quarter uh, by 50 percent. We only had four deliverables this quarter, and we missed two of them. That, that put us into the alert status. Um, uh, we are recasting this project. As a result of that, we're extending the project timeline by one month. There is anticipated to be no uh, cost implications to this project. By and large, it's been resource allocations. We're on our fourth, excuse me, our third uh, project manager from the vendor community. They just keep churning through project managers, and so they've been un unable to keep staff, just like many of the cabinet agencies has been, have been as well. So that's had a resulting uh, impact to the project. Yeah, well, and that and that's from, that's been since March of of twenty one. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that would create a problem. The upside is we've got the same um, project deliverable resource within the, uh, within the vendor, uh, the, the, the consulting firm, but their project manager has turned over three times. They're currently searching for the fourth. Wow. Any other questions from anybody? Okay. Well, hopefully by the next one there will be a little bit more on schedule, hopefully. Yes, All right, thank you for your answering your questions, or questions. Bring that down. Um, and uh, as always, um, I just try to highlight the um, approved projects for Q3. Um, the Department of Administration Talent Management and Learning Management System, and you all know what that is now uh, as we talk through it. It was approved at the beginning of Q3, and actually we um, deployed on November 1st. Now, it's a long rollout period across all state agencies, but it went live on November 1, so it has actually gone live as of Q4. It will still stay as an open project because it's not completely done, but just to give you a sense of it, um, it wasn't a long project, um, but um, it has large and impactful implications. Um, other projects that were approved on a, in Q3, KDHE's electronic uh, visitor verification system and Pittsburgh State uh, uh, University State Student Financial Aid System project. Um, those are four new projects. As always, as a reminder, um, we sent in the email when we sent the 
uh, the quarterly report. We sent the link again to the dashboard, which we've highlighted here a couple of times. And, and remember on that dashboard, you can see planned, active, um, uh, yeah, the uh, completed and the approved all listed there um, with links back to the reports. And some of them have links to uh, various different project plans uh, available there as well. So if there's details that you're looking for, uh, a lot of them can be found, some of those high level details there. Any additional questions around the IT? Senator Pittman. Thank you, thank you for all this information. On those approved projects, you know, we're talking about the risk-based matrix coming up soon. I'm excited about that and how we're going to maybe tackle projects in the future from a legislative oversight and uh, approval. Would those three projects fall into a category where we would have oversight in terms of risk and impact, do you think? Or maybe you don't know. They might not know the details on those things. What I would say is looking at them. So, for instance, the KDHE one, for sure, no matter what, because it's a $2.7 million project. Right, the talent uh, management and learning management system, for instance, is uh, only it came in at uh, four hundred and ninety four, uh, four hundred ninety four thousand, so a little under five hundred thousand. Right, so from a a pure two fifty, it would have been above previously as it was this time. From a risk, it pro it probably has not high of, as high of a risk, um, but I would have said that it probably still would have been reportable because that particular system touches all state employee personal data, right? So that's a good example of when you think about, oh, it's just a learning management system. It's just where people go to train. But one of the risk categories that it would have been looked at is what data, where do you interface? It interfaces directly with SHARP, our HR system, because it ties all activity that you're doing in that talent and learning management system directly to your HR record. Right, And so because of that, it would have still been, let's say it was a little bit less than what it came in at. Let's say it came in at a slightly lower dollar amount, not above uh, 250. Let's say it was 150 or just 200,000, right? Because of that, it still may have had or had components of it where we wanted to make sure that there were pieces that were monitored because of the level of risk of the data integration. And then the student financial aid system would have definitely still been reportable it again came in, it's about a, a $760,000 project, but again, it is a system that we know interfaces directly with student um, and parent uh, data information, that, that protected type of data information, and because of that level of risk, all three of these would have, let's say that their dollar amounts were a little bit lower, the nature at least of those two systems would have probably still put them in that risk-based category. <laughs> But under the same vein, if with the current system, if if the um, the tracking, um, I guess that's the best way to say it, the tracking um, software would have come in at two hundred thousand, we wouldn't have seen it. Under the current system, if it had to come in and in at two hundred thousand, you would have not have. Yeah. So, for instance. Um, we went with a vendor because of the platform that it was and that we had other agencies in there and it matched on to us perfectly. Let's say that the vendor that we use for our current HR system had a bolt on and said, we can bolt all of this on and it'll just cost the state for implementation because you already have our full system an additional 100,000, right? Under the current system, we might not have seen that because it looks one way, but when you look at the nature of that project because of what all it's touching, you want to make sure. And so let's say it came in that low. This is where, as we look at these risk-based models, it may not have fallen into that high risk where you're doing extra reporting. Maybe it fell into a medium risk category, and while they didn't have to do all the reporting, we are asking that, or, that there is at least a risk mitigation plan around your data and that that is filed appropriately so that we know that the data risks are taken care of. And that might just check the box for you, but we've done that process. So that's part of what I think as we envision it, it's not like even a one size fit all. If it's something that really is, oh, we have a full system, we're adding this piece, but it has an increased risk because of the type of data that it touches, right? Is there just simply in that case, no, you're not doing tons of filing like you would do for a large project, but we are making sure that, say, 
a plan is on place that identifies and documents your uh, data security, data governance strategy in relationship to the new data that's being pulled into this particular project. Does that help? Yeah. No, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So any other questions, committee? Okay. And then All right. the completed ones, is there anything that was completed in the last? Uh, there are. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I have them. Let's see. We should have had a number of them completed. I don't have them on a slide. Let me see yeah, what that I, list. Yeah, I'm looking at that. All the ones that are shown as completed, those were completed in this last quarter. They were included completed during this quarter. That's okay, when they were that's completed. what I was. Yeah. When we mark them completed in this, it means they completed and they sent. They um, have filed their closeout report during that particular quarter. That's how we close them out. Okay. Yeah. So correct. There's, there's should be about a dozen, maybe a little over a dozen, mm -hmm. something like that. So. About 15 completed during this period. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Go Just on. Very quickly, um, ITEC did meet um, since the last time we were together. We met in September. Um, we do have a couple of new members um, as rotations are shifting through. Um, Secretary Amber Schultz, Department of Labor, is uh, replacing. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee Norman, Secretary of uh, KDHE, just rotation time, and thought that that would be a great agency to be a part of uh, these conversations. Um, and then Eric Norris, who's the state librarian, stepped in as one of the non-cabinet roles. Subsequently, uh, we were notified that Eric will be leaving the state, and so we will be having to approach the non-cabinet agencies for a new cabinet, uh, non-cabinet agency head to sit in that seat. And then uh, Mike Maida was actually reappointed as one of our uh, local government representatives. Uh, we met on September 14th, um, and um, pretty much business as usual. We talked a lot about the risk framework like we talked about here today and share some things with them as we knew we would be continuing these conversations here as well. Gave, uh, you know, standard updates, CEDO, CISA, cybersecurity, some of what you'll hear today. We're a little bit further along now, so you guys will hear more than they heard around uh, the task force. The one thing that uh, we did complete at the kind of the business that was completed is the policy series 5000. This is the um, contingency business planning, the COOP uh, for a short. Um, we talked about, and this one, uh, We've talked about and we've been working on all year. This was one of the three that had smaller working groups that were bringing updates to this series. So this is just our policy of cleaning it up and bringing it up to, to speed. And this was the last one to come through. We refreshed policy 5300 and 5310. They were both discussed and approved. One of the things that we have tried to do this year as we, when we rolled out 8,000 series, when we are rolling out this 5,000 series update, we are trying to put resources around the agencies so that as we're updating these policies, they don't, or they aren't like, well, how do we do that? Or, or what are we supposed to do? So we've been putting, um, you know, workshops together, toolkits, um, resources from Kiso's office, from uh, OITS and other various offices for implementation purposes once the policies are updated. Um, 8000 series was a great example because the 8000 series was around data governance. So there were actual things in there that got updated that some agencies maybe didn't know how to do or didn't have the tools to do. So like we've set up a series of workshops that agencies join to help them understand how to implement the changes to the 8000 series. Based on the feedback we've heard from that, we will be doing the same for anything that we see in the 5000 series update um, that could be helpful to be able to be a tool particularly to the smaller cabinet agencies that don't have full-time IT staff to make sure they're in compliance with the policies. So, and if you don't have it, we'll make sure that we get a copy to you of the updated uh, 5000 series that was approved in September. So that- That, that would be great, because I don't think we do have that, so. That was the, the major, uh, the majority of our business. We do meet again in December. Um, the date excludes me, but, um, is it the ninth? Um, so it's early December, but we do have an ITEC meeting coming up in December. So with that, I think our last area is our cybersecurity task force. And um, 
I am going to um, ask uh, my CISO, Jeff Maxson, to give you an update. He is also uh, the uh, chair of it. Couple of things I just wanna share. Um, I've been in meetings all day, but as my team listens in, I understand that uh, some of the conversations earlier today may have touched on the Cybersecurity Task Force and some of the recommendations. And so I wanna definitely say just a couple of things to put in context as we share the updates as to where we are. Um, we have uh, lots of vendor partners out there that have reached out to us, very similar to the organization that you heard from this morning. As we are doing this, they are eager to engage with the state and partner with the state as they see aspects of our recommendations evolving that they think that they can be helpful with. So please know that we are engaged in those conversations in many different ways, but we also try to be very careful because working with our vendor partners, we have to abide by all the statutes that you have in place in terms of making sure we're being competitive. But one of the recommendations that is emerging out of here is to stand up a few more master level contracts where we have have categories within cybersecurity and have multiple vendors already on state contract so that when an agency needs something or a political subdivision, they're already on state contract and then you can just go in with a task order and get them engaged. That's an emerging recommendation that it was in the interim report. So it plays into us being able to have these conversations and create that space. The other thing that I want to make sure just uh, we are still in process um, and so we are uh, it was an interim report and our final report is not due until um, early December and we're working towards that date um, and refining and gathering stakeholder feedback. So we appreciate all the feedback that's coming in from vendors and other stakeholders to help us shape this. Um, but I do wanna to note um, that for us as a state, given that our you know, our, even our Kansas Information Security Office is still, you know, only three years old, and that act is still only three years old. This is one, and while there have been a number of different um, groups or committees that have come together more at the state level to talk cybersecurity, this is really one of the first opportunities where we've had this cross-sector, public and private, state and local um, education, all health, all around the table, thinking strategically about whole estate. So I leave that there to say, we recognize that the recommendations are just the beginning. And our goal, if you have listened to us or seen any of our notes, is that we have been intent from the beginning to say that we're also not trying to put out a report or a set of recommendations that are gonna sit on a shelf. That we are looking to put recommendations in place that are actionable and looking for entities and partners that can immediately leverage in to getting this work done because we know it as a priority. But we have to start with the foundation of actually getting us around the table having that collective conversation and giving us a framework to start from to do this work. With that, I'm gonna ask Jeff to give a brief report of where we are at this stage. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Maxson. I am one of the chairs of the Cybersecurity Task Force. And today I'll just give you a brief update on, on where we are with the task force. So I believe everyone should have received a digital copy of the interim report that we created. Um, and so I'm just gonna cover a few things out of that as well and kind of give it a brief update of where we're at. So a little background real quickly. So. In July, the governor signed Executive Order 2125, which established the Kansas Cybersecurity Task Force with the goal of really to evaluate, you know, the whole of state of cybersecurity, where places we can build partnerships and really kind of raise the cybersecurity of not just state of Kansas, but Kansas as a whole. So our partners at the local levels, critical infrastructure, you know, how do we start working together um, in a fashion? Um, the interim report was delivered on... on uh, October 5th to the governor's office, and that report contained a set of 45 recommendations. And again, these are just initial recommendations. As the secretary mentioned, we are working to refine them um, and add additional recommendations as we continue to work through. Um, so members of the task force were meeting uh, about two hours every week 
since August. Um, and so we're trying to be very cognizant of folks' time. We do have a short time frame because the final report is due to the governor's office here in a little over two weeks. So again, we're moving fast and, and to the point of, you know, being very focused on trying to figure out the, the spaces of strategically working together in a whole of state perspective. So our 45 recommendations were initially broken down into two, two subcategories. We have near-term recommendations, which we expect we could probably get implemented in, in approximately six months, and then a set of long-term recommendations that once we start will probably likely take a little bit longer than six months to implement if they're choose to be pursued. So and a reminder, we broke down the task force into four subcommittees and also in our interim report, we broke down recommendations based on the subcommittees they came out of. And just as a reminder, we had the strategic visioning and planning subcommittee, again, really looking at kind of strategic efforts um, and, and how to build a strategy and also some of the long-term term visions of the state. Uh, statewide coordination collaboration subcommittee, again, really focusing on that coordination collaboration. And as you'll see, that, that is kind of a theme that we heard from a lot of our stakeholders um, out, out in the, the ecosystem is really that collaboration coordination is key. The third subcommittee is the cyber incident disruption response. And the fourth committee is workforce development and education. And on the screen and in your slides is some near-term recommendations we pulled out of the reports for some context. I think as the secretary mentioned, you know, some of them are very, very detailed and some of them are just very high level um, and some of them get into a little more weeds. So for example, that, that recommendation of having a, a master contract that is available to all political subdivisions, you know, really assessing what we currently have and finding ways to make that available and make resources more readily available to organizations. Again, finding ways to facilitate that coordination collaboration, whether it's through a position or different organizations, um, to really work with our partners at the local level, uh, the region's institutions, uh, critical infrastructure as well. And then also really looking at how we respond to cyber incidents at all levels and begin to uh, follow what some other states are doing and really treating it almost like as a natural disaster in terms of emergency response and developing what that looks like. And one of the other key things that we've, we've noticed, and as the Secretary mentioned, we do notice there's a lot more to this, um, and this task force is just a very small part. There are a lot more areas to explore that we're still looking into, and there will be, need to be further efforts, both near-term and long-term, to continue this process of evaluating the landscape and, and making additional recommendations and establishing additional work. So additionally, as I mentioned, also long-term recommendations were developed. And again, you know, as I said, this is not a one-time effort. You know, there needs to be process to continuously evaluate the environment um, in terms of threats and what's happening in the environment. And so again, long-term recommendation of establishing that persistent cadence and also keeping in mind that, you know, cybersecurity is something that needs to transcend and last uh, among position changes, administration changes, um, and, and things like that. So again, a recommendation about how do we sustain this long-term because the environment is constantly changing and we need to evaluate and, and address that. Um, you know, and some of the other key things we're, we, we learn from stakeholders and internal discussion with the task force is, again, that education awareness uh, campaign. Uh, how do we work with, with our partners um, and to both share information, letting them know what available resources are out there, and just developing that relationship is, is key. So next steps for the task force, as the secretary mentioned, we're continuing to refine uh, recommendations. We're continuing to hear from stakeholders. Uh, this week is our last week of meeting within our subcommittees before we produce the final report. So we're, we're wrapping up, um, but we have built new recommendations, refined the existing recommendations. We are looking at kind of trying to put some criticalities amongst recommendations to define what might be critical path to, to further success, and then ultimately deliver the final report to the governor on December, the week of December 5th. With that, stand for any questions. Committee, any questions? All right, I guess not. All right. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Senator Pittman and myself serve on the on this, and um, I, I guess maybe this question to the to Secre Secretary. Um, you know, one of the things that we have talked about is 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 there going to be a 
are, are you going to bring maybe a, a, a bill to um, create a legislative task force or, or, or create a task force through legislative means? I would say at this stage, I don't. No. I don't know that that is the plan. Um, and part of it, let me say, let me say it this way. What we have found is that we actually have a couple of other standing entities already that some of this falls under. So before we go all the way to creating a new one, we want to make sure whether it's under various other auspices that we are actually levering what already exists from things under KISO, things under ITEC, things under KDEM, and things under TAG that have some of these responsibility already in, in, under their authority, but they're not aligned or coordinated in the right way. So I would say that that is probably not, from my standpoint, our first next step, because I think that there are some of those entities that actually we haven't leveraged into around this issue in the way that we could to begin the movement. Okay, great. I, I'm glad to hear that. That, Yeah, I, and it's been, it's been a couple of weeks, I think, since I've been able to, to be on one of the the task force, I know, yeah, I'm gonna get in trouble here with Senator Pittman, but um, so uh, yeah, I know, and I know that that was something that was kind of talked about maybe early on that we needed to do something to, if we were going to continue the work, and I'm not sure an executive order was a, is all you know is a great way to continue that. So um, and and I think it's partially because it's been a, a journey of discovery, right? As we started to talk to others, you know, when we talk about some of this like incident response, particularly like there are pieces of if you look at you know KDEM language of it doesn't specifically say cyber, but we have the some of the infrastructure that could be leveraged in that way. But we might need to do some things a little bit differently or tweak it or stand up resources around it for it to be flexible enough to lean into a cyber-related incident differently than what we think of as a, that natural disaster incident. So as that came out, I think, through more and more of the conversations in the subcommittees, I think that it kind of stepped back from some of that initial thinking, oh, we have to stand something else up to be able to do this. Okay, great. Yeah, because that's one of the things that I had brought up in the past that I, I really didn't want to start a whole new, even almost, a, it looked like to me a whole new agency in, in some ways, um, you know, if we've got existing personnel and existing uh, um, committees that are already doing it. So I'm glad to, that we're moving in that direction. Any other, any other questions? Did you have some? Yeah, Alan? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I stated the wrong date for the next ITEC meeting. It's uh, December 13th at 3 p.m. That's on a, mo a Monday. All right, great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions about the Cybersecurity Task Force? So, um, again, I mean, going back to some of the things that, that uh, like I say, I've, it's been a bit... I know that we're establishing relationships with um, with the locals is one of the things that that was that's been talked about. Um, what about the um, South Dakota model? Have we even looked at that at all? As far as minimum cyber, I think it was minimum cybersecurity standards that that they must have put. And I and I'm going to have James kind of pull that up for you know for a review later. But uh, have, have, has that even come up at all? No, sir, we haven't specifically looked. Okay, at I didn't think it had, but I, yeah. I will. I, we have engaged our partners at National Governors Association to evaluate most of what they see happening in the country at the various different state levels, and have engaged multiple states. But North Dakota was not one, of, or South Dakota was not one of them. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I guess we'll go on. Okay. Then. All right. Um, I think that is the end of our section. I know I am a part of the next discussion as well. But thank you very much for listening to the executive branch uh, updates. And as always, if there are questions or things that come up, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and the team um, so that we can get you the information that you need. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, since we have the secretary here right now, we're going to go ahead and go into the discussion for the um, proposed legislation. And before we uh, uh, look at our last two um, 
um, testimonies. I've had multiple discussions with um, Secretary Burns Wallace about this, trying to figure out where we can go with some with some legislation that that works works with doesn't slow projects down to a to halt, but yet also gets this committee more involved in the the process of of these uh, um, projects before they're really approved and, and gone, you know, you know, we've talked about this many times. We see them after they've, after they're approved and after they're imp started implementing. And so um, what I would like to do is try to get some sort of, of a plan to um, go forward that Matt can create a, a bill for us that then we can look at on, in our December meeting that will kind of, uh, and we can change it then, but at least we can have kind of a framework in our December meeting of what we kind of want that bill to look like um, going forward if we want to go forward with the bill. So um, if that makes sense, then I, I think what I'll do is just have Secretary come up first and talk about the, the memo that you that you gave us, because I think that this is a good place to start as far as where this process maybe could go. So, And thank you, um, Chair. Um, and, and please understand what we drafted was truly that a start. I had a long conversation with Representative Hoffman and trying to think about where our process was, what information we had, what we were pushing to you, and the objectives. I told my team, where can we start this conversation? So you all should have received, a, and you should have a hard copy of uh, a chart, and I apologize, we don't have it electronically to, pu to pu push up. Um, but this is the current process, if you take out the yellow box, for instance, of the keto process, it's actually, 15 layers more complicated than that. But after my team sent me like a flow chart that was like this long, I said, figure out how to put it on a slide. <laughs> so this is our attempt to kind of, and there's multiple other things going on underneath, but just trying to give you a step, right? So depending on the project, these are the various pieces. The couple things I wanna bring to your attention, you see every place that it's red, that means as a CETO myself, Amar Allen or Kelly, we actually touch a project multiple times of review before a project is moved. So that's one thing that I wanted to make sure that you all had that full awareness. It's not even if we see it one time, depending on the size and scale of the project, we touch it at a minimum of twice, but in with larger projects, sometimes three times in terms of reviewing materials as it moves through before it is ever begin to execute. So what we were thinking, and uh, Representative Hoffman, Chair Hoffman, has mentioned a few times around joint buildings, on the Joint Committee on State Buildings, and how they review leases. And switching my hat to DFA, I'm aware of that, but I'm also aware that like, we don't stop the leases if they don't meet. And so I asked my team, go pull that so I understand, so that we can talk through it and see if that was kind of similar to what you may be thinking, right? And so we pull the language and, and the language is does say advise and consult and it gives them it gives them a stated period of time. I have seven days here because that's what it gives them. I'm not saying that that is this process. That's how theirs is set up. It gives them a trigger in, but we don't hold them. We keep the process moving. And so what we thought as a beginning point is the yellow box. Once that high level plan comes in, it would almost like, it. and part of this has to do with us automating parts of our system as well, which gives us a little bit more ability, we think, to be able to help execute this. As that comes in, it would start a clock and a trigger where a sample email like the one we gave you would come out and saying, new plan is, high level plan has been filed. Here are some of the high level details. You'd be able to click on that link to actually take you to the high level, you know, if, if you wanted more report, just like what's on the dashboard. 
um, for instance, but it gave you kind of the high, the quick, and the dirty. We could add more to that or whatever would felt comfortable. But understand that between that high-level plan coming in and that CETO approval, that doesn't happen overnight and doesn't happen in a day. There's a bunch of other steps that are happening on my keto side, so it takes a little bit of time. And then when it comes to each of us CETOs, I don't get project plans and hit approve, right? Then I'm reviewing multiple things. Sometimes I'm asking questions. I may send it back, various other things, right? So we thought that that might be an appropriate place to overlay it because that's not like an overnight process. So while we're doing some of the background checking, clean, making sure things are aligning, the CEDO was doing their review, it would be the same period where you all could review and, you know, ask any questions or send feedback or that type of thing. And it comes back into that process, but back into that CEDO as we are pulling everything together, because we are typically looking at multiple pieces and any of questions or recommendations from here, that would be a good point to be looking at and says, yep, okay, nope, that's in there, let's pull that out. Or nope, maybe that's a question that we need to get answered as we are moving to and through our process. Because it's not a quick process. It looks like it's a simple step, but that step actually takes us a period of time because that's a critical review by our team of that high-level plan because that is what triggers with that approval in, in the fifth step, that is what triggers their ability for the RFP to go out, right? They cannot, the Office of Procurement will not accept it, their RFP, unless my letter for executive branch is in their RFP packet. They're like, where's your CTO letter, right? So that is just the beginning of where we thought might be um, a way to start this conversation. Okay, yeah, that's great. I appreciate that. So getting back to the building committee and mirroring them, you, they get an email, because I, I don't sit on that committee, but they get an email. What if they're meeting? I mean, I guess, it, do they still get the email even if they're meeting that same so if they're meet like so it is used in the instance when they're not meeting. So let's say there's three that are coming up and they're meeting next week. When we get go when that my team that does leases goes through their regular report, they would just present those three during that meeting, right? So if it lined up, you could definitely do it. But it's a process by which when they're not meeting, it doesn't stop us from continuing to move those leases because I am signing those type those amendments and leases, you know, all the time throughout the year. Yeah, and that was that was one of the, the committee. That was one of the things that that uh, secretary and I talked about because we didn't want to, we don't want to create a bottleneck, but we f for sure want to try to to figure out a way that we we have more input in the the pre the pre RFP planning. So uh, so I guess I'll just kind of throw this out to everybody so that Matt kind of has an idea of when he starts uh, creating. Wh what do you think as far as this is a starting point. Is this is this the direction you think we should go? Um, we'll, we'll get into the risk base later. But as far as this part, what what do you think? I mean, are, are you is this what we were thinking about, or is it not? Anyway, uh, Representative Curtis. Okay, I'll start us off. <laughs> um, I I mean. I like this, actually. My questions will be just to make sure that timing-wise, that where we're inserted, that we're inserted in the correct place where, you know, our feedback or whatever is going to be valuable to the process. And then also, like you said, not to be a clog in the wheel. That was my main concern because it's like, we had a hard enough time getting this meeting together. <laughs> we certainly don't want to put ourselves in a position where we could potentially just create a lot of problems and become a real barrier to the process. So that part I like. And then I guess the other question that I would have as a member, member of this committee then that would be you know, getting these emails or being asked to provide this feedback, just a little guidance on by which criteria or what lens we look at the projects through. I mean, just a little more guidance on that. Like when I'm looking at it, some have a lot more technical expertise, some some don't, but just if there's any guidance, like what lens do I look through and what, what am I 
by, by what, what, what what's my evaluation means. So anyway, those are those are my comments. But I generally I, I, I like this direction. I think that puts us in a good decision making a part of the process without really becoming a barrier to the process. Yeah, and, and that might be, I don't know that that would be necessarily something that we, uh, that lens might be, if you're not a, a, you know, real technical person, maybe it's, you know, well, have you looked at other options as far as, you know, have you looked at, I don't know for sure. Um, I, I think it's just, a lot of it is, is us being able to know, okay, these projects are, are, moving forward and they're out there, um, you know, and the modernization committee has been a, a great, you know, idea of how that, that all worked. I mean, if I think that my idea is that the RFP would have looked a lot different for the modernization if it would have been done after the modernization committee had a chance to, to look at some of the things that they had that they were able to look at now we may that was one project i'm not saying we can probably there's multiple projects and so we're not going to be able to necessarily maybe go into as much detail as they were able to on just because they were so focused on one project but i think that there there were a lot of questions that came out that that you know people started asking that then turned into other you know, other, well, maybe we should have put that in that RFP or, or is this, you know, so I think those are the type of questions that, um, you know, maybe, so, yeah, Risen Pittman, I'm Senator Pittman, sorry. <laughs> I, I think this is a great idea. I like the idea of having this in the process. I do like the idea. Uh, we've talked about this extensively that, uh, you know, the technology uh, investments that we're making are on par with a lot of the uh, building things and they do last for a long time, potentially. Um, and uh, having some oversight and some understanding. If nothing else, it's going to help us build an understanding and a competency inside the legislature, and that's very exciting to me in particular that maybe that can be something that we, as we move along, will leave behind as a, as a great thing for us to, to look back and say that's great. I think there's obviously some things about how we're going to execute it that are going to, we're going to have to work out. Um, how we uh, j judge, I think, the dimensions how we, uh, how we, why would we ever say no or yes? That wasn't politically oriented, but really merit based and risk based and architecturally based. And how do we move things forward? So I think it's a, it's a really neat idea, and I'm really supportive of it. And and ultimately, we can't say no, <laughs> except with the checkbook. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the. I mean, we can say no. We're not going to put any money towards it. So, you know, but we can't actually stop the project except through the checkbook. So, yeah, Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bring up an excellent point. We have to have some oversight authority. Otherwise, it's pretty much a waste of time. So we need some teeth in it because and a prime example is rules and regulations. Um, we have given comments to departments and agencies some of the rules and regs that come through us. And since the legislature turned over legislative authority through a bill or statute, that we cannot rein that back. And so we're going to actually be looking at a constitutional amendment to rein that in. A prime example, you guys may not have been aware of this, but the cosmetology board came in and gave us approximately 10, over 10 pages of new rules and regs regulations that they decided to implement. And we asked them why. Nothing changed in statute. Nothing had changed. And they just felt like they needed to review them and update them. And those were very, it put some businesses out of business. So that having that much authority is not what the legislature intended through rules and regs, and we have to have that authority because we may give comments, and they may be excellent comments, and they could disregard them for the IT project and continue what they're doing and going down the wrong path. So I would ask that the committee put some teeth in it, as the good senator said. And, and that being said, what what's your recommendation? <laughs> I mean, really, because I'm not sure... I'm, Besides the the 
the checkbook part of it. I'm not sure. But the checkbook, we don't have that authority until the full legislature is in session. True. So that maybe that is something that this committee would have access to suspending the finances of a project until the full body met. I mean, I'm, it's just a thought, but there does need to be some teeth in it. Okay. All right. Anything else? Anybody else? Yeah, Brabs and Curtis. On the building commission, do they have any teeth? <laughs> Just wondering. Yeah, I, I'm not totally sure. I mean, they cannot stop. A, they can't say a project can't go forward. Um, but they can make a recommendation. Yeah, they can recommendation that it doesn't go forward, and then that would that would then trigger, I would think, on the legis uh, on the budget side, a. I mean, docking building is a great example. I mean. And yeah, it's been, you know, thrown around back and forth quite a bit, but um, they really, nobody went forward to that until they really got full approval from, you know, the, everybody, you know, so, um, so yeah, I don't know. Sure. Would you like to? Yeah, no, I, it's a, a recommendation, but no, they cannot, they cannot stop a lease. Again, the, the, where the legislative trigger is, is that if they, hold or impact the funding. So does the building committee have the ability to do that? I mean, do they have, they don't have the ability. No, to, they, they just the can make a recommendation that it, that the funding is withheld. Correct. To the legislature. Okay. And we can do a little bit more research. I mean, and I, I, part of it is we can, you know, look at her as you all draft up the language. I think we can all lean into it in our legal counsel. In that, in the building space, you know, we do this a ton, and so I know our legal counsel can help, you know, say, okay, this is how that language works. And so I think the a piece of this is that if this is kind of the direction we want to go, if we start putting language on paper, then we can then begin to see how that comes together and, and how that language holds. So the one thing I will note is we drafted a sample email, and it looks very simplistic. Right, but please understand, and this is something that, as I think Senator Pittman was alluding to, in terms of the operationalizing it, that high-level plan, depending on the nature of the project, and with the high-level plan for the really large projects, the feasibility studies, that documentation that I go through as a CTO is it's not like this. It's like this, right? And so part of that is is that there is a lot of that, right? It doesn't simply say like this date to this date or this dollar amount, like there are full schedules across dates and times and dollars and all of that. That is a part of those plans. And then potentially, again, those larger projects that trigger a feasibility study before they can even put a project plan together, the high level plan, they have to do the feasibility study to say, is this even feasible? Yep, you get that approval, then you move to your high level plan. So I say that to say that there is a lot more that's here. And so that is where I think when we, if we get to a place of a, of a comfort level of how this works from a, a legislative standpoint of, you know, kind of that piece, that operationalizing, there could be more that's pulled out or, or whatever, again, that link to it, but there is a little bit to Representative Curtis's a question, you know, we, we can do some of that training about what is in that high level plan and what are you looking at and what do you see? We review them all the time. And I will tell you, every time I have to review these, I stop and have to sit down and kind of go back to make sure I am looking at and reviewing all the necessary pieces accordingly as I'm walking through it. Um, and again, my counterparts that are CETO, when they have projects, they do as well. I And, and they can, I don't want to speak for them, there are some slight differences because a lot of times if it's a legislative project that's coming through the legislative CETO, like you're not as big. And so a lot of times he and his office is involved in the actual project. Same with judicial. The seat that I sit in, I am looking at everything from the executive branch, including the region institutions. So it, it's a lot of different pieces and variations um, that we see. Um, and sometimes a high level plan can be, you know, 
20 pages, and then sometimes it's 100 plus because the feasibility study is a part of it because it's a larger project, which would warrant that. And many of those, and again, from the seat that I sit in, we're going back and forth. My team goes back and forth before it ever comes to me, and then I go back and forth as well. So part of this is also, I'm, I'm just wanting to be as transparent as we can about the process because sometimes it's about like the process and the lack of that transparency in the process may feel like it's just moving and they're just moving through, but there are a lot of different steps and layers that are going there. And so we were just trying to find um, to Representative Hoffman's kind of request, where can we overlay that where we thought it would be a helpful use or helpful point of information that was hardy enough for you to get a good sense of the project, but also be able to continue to move um, the process along. So. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I was just about to uh, uh, introduce you. I think Senator Holland has a question. And I apologize to the committee because I'm traveling in my car coming back from Indiana visiting my dad. So if I'm not inserting myself in the appropriate part of the conversation, I apologize. I, I think we're probably talking about follow ups to maybe some legislation that the committee talked about introducing last year is that correct early this year mr chair is that correct as far as yeah yes that's correct project? yes okay so just my two cents and i will uh dot, dial off here uh, and listen but um uh, i'm going to go back to the point that uh project failure 95 percent of the time you're talking about critical project failures catastrophic failures it has nothing to do with technology it has everything to do with basically misalignment of stakeholder expectations. Um, and I, I say this not to sound political or anything at all like that. Uh, I am very comfortable right now with what Secretary Burns Wallace brings to the table. And we have a my understanding the full staff of CETOs in place. And uh, but and and so while right now the environment may not appear to be as less risky uh, make no mistake, administrations change, secretaries change, CETOs come and go. Um, and my fear, quite honestly, is that what you have is you have a future critical project that comes on the horizon where a secretary of a department uh, will basically pretty much work with an outside vendor uh, for whatever set of expectations or drivers is driving the implementation of the solution. And basically, they just, you know, steamroll right through the process. Uh, once getting out of the auspices of like, well, everybody did their homework and there's no reason to worry. Uh, we have just had too many system failures of significant imports uh, in my mind, not to put something in the works where projects of a certain type of risk threshold, uh, I believe they should require before they go forward uh, basically, this committee or, or some alternative legislative approval before they go forward. I would just harken back to the uh, UI Modernization Committee, uh, of which I, you know, through the Commerce Committee, I and others obviously had input on, and I felt you know were able to to shape direction of that. Uh, the point is, is that once again, when you have people clearly scrutinizing something that's massively critical, like those systems are. Okay, you get a good work product in because people are looking at it, they're poking at it, they are asking good questions, they're getting under the covers. And I think you, for certain critical projects, you need to have an affirmative from JCIT or whatever legislative body before you go forward. I just think it's, uh, we have a track record that proves that we're being foolish if we don't put something like that in place for some, some set of critical projects. So with that, I will stand out, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, body's intelligence. And, and Senator, if, if you could stay on for it, just a few minutes, if that's okay. If um, sure. Or did you do you have to go or? No, no, no. I no, I can listen oh. in. I just don't know if I'm talking on my cell phone. I know if I'm introducing static or whatever. Or oh, okay. No, you're the, you're not. But I, so you're going to be okay. listening because I. Oh yeah. The, what we've got before us, and I know you, you you can't see it, and we'll we'll make sure you get it. This would um, this would basically put a JCIT notification right after the agency high level plan. 
which I think everybody is kind of in agreement with that that's maybe a good spot for it. I think where we're, where we're maybe getting held up and you bring it up and Senator Tyson's brought it up is the actual, um, the actual teeth, I guess, in the, in it to say yes or no on the project. And so I guess I've always kind of been under the, under the impression talking to um, revisers and, and research that we really have to, that's a, that's a really hard part to put in there because of the separation of, of uh, um, the branches. So what do you think on that? I mean, what, what is, do you believe that we can do something like that or, or what's your thought, I guess? Well, look, I'm not an attorney, so I can't opine on what that means. But I will say this: I, I, I do, uh, I do fully agree with the secretary as far as where we need to come in um, on this. Um, my feeling is, is that we need to see the RFP. All right, we need to understand the project plan, we need to see the RFP before anything gets left. But what I am also telling you is, is that it's more than just a passive review. We need to be able to say that we're going to go for certain projects. Otherwise, it's, it's, it, it won't matter. It just won't matter because you will have a, some time in the future, you will have a secretary that is hooked up with a new lobbyist. They will, you know, push a system development effort through of several millions of dollars. And if there's a political will to make it happen, they will push it through the process. I mean, this is just like the, the concession sausage making. So if you're all familiar with it, or some special interest, the concession comes up, and it's like, hey, we've got a bill. We've got to get this through. No, no time to, to really scrutinize it. Just trust us. Doing the same thing with the rights and systems. We all know better. That's why I think we need to have certain systems small but critical subset, the ability to basically stop the letting of an RFP before it gets out. So I think if I, if I understood you, and you're breaking up a little bit, but I think if I understood you right, you're saying that, that maybe an additional look at the, once the, before the RFP is put out and, and actually a look at the RFP um, no, actual RFP before it's put out. Yes, exactly. We okay. gotta have, have it before the RFP goes out the screen. Because that doubles the details of the RFP. That's where so many projects in my estimation on track is that the RFP. Once again, for experienced IT professionals, it's not that much of a risk. But once again, new people coming in, do whatever's going through this process, it's gonna make a mistake, those RFPs, whatever we need by the vendors, okay, because they will be in constant contact with those secretaries and their people trying to basically uh, couch whatever the terms of the RFP to get the people their way so they can see what you can propose. You know, we've got to be able to catch with the RFP. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank so, you, um, actually, Secretary, would you like to touch that? I think as we continue this conversation, I'd like to look at that. I don't know if I'm standing here today based on what we've done that that would be what I would recommend. What you have before you is that based on our team, the process that we move through, um, what we know of this process and how we move things through and what the materials are, this is what we truly believe would be um, helping to get to the spirit of what we discussed. So at this time, I can ne necessarily say one way or another around that RFP review. I do have concerns in that. Um, and uh, I want to think about that more and maybe give this committee a thoughtful answer. And I need to do it through two different hats because I would like to do that both from my CEDO hat, but I also need to do that from the Department of Administration hat um, because of the statutes and RFP process on that side as well. Any other, yep, Senator Tyson. And um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just echo that Senator um, Holland's comments 
were in line with what you had said about the unemployment oversight being involved in the RFP process up front. And I think the Unemployment Oversight Council demonstrated how constructive we can make the RFP process to get a better quality product. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Amex, did you have a question? Uh, not really a question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for the recognition. Uh, somebody that has not been a part of this committee at all, I would want to say one thing, that it appears to me that this helps with transparency. Uh, as you go through the process of establishing this, one of the things that seems extremely important to me is that the public understand, you know, bits and pieces of projects as they come forward. I think a, a lot of the recommendations that you all are making is exactly that. And I think the teeth, as uh, uh, Senator Tyson talks about, is, you know, if the recommendation is to whether or not to fund a project, I think those are pretty pretty strong teeth when it comes down to it. So anyway, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I do like the location of where this is inserted in early. However, my concern is on the seven days, it might need to be double that. I mean, sometimes some weeks it gets a little busy in your other life where we have citizen legislators and Recognizing, understand that language is what is in the, uh, around joint buildings. And so, again, we pulled that as an example because Representative Hoffman in our conversations has um, referenced it many times. I would assume as we build out the, um, the language here that you, we would come up with that. What I will say, recognizing that, please also understand that like, as we move through this process, part of it is also wanting to give you all enough time, but also understanding the length of our projects. And so I ask that as we think about that, that we come up with, a, if that's the approach that we take, that we come up with a good balance that helps us continue to move the process along, particularly for those projects where everything is good, everyone is comfortable, that, that we're not sitting in that, that delay space but do recognize that again, that is not our recommendation in terms of just like seven days. It's in that memo um, and you guys have an updated uh, chart in front of you. It's in the memo because that is their language um, and we pulled it as just simply a reference point. Thank you, just wanted to note that. I, I think one of the issues that we have is that there are, when we build a building, I mean, we usually it's a it's a it's a big it's a big investment, but it's also um, the most of them are are going to cost about the same. They're going to we have so many different IT projects that are that are all over the place as far as cost and and even if and we get into the if we get into the risk base, we got those that are going to be all over the place in the risk. You know, base and some of them may come up as far as being risky, but yet not really being that much money. And um, and we as a committee might not look at it as being quite that big of a deal. But when you get into an eighty million dollar project, all of a sudden it we we do all of a sudden, and that's that's a big big thing. So I'm not sure. Um, and you know, we've mulled this over. You know so much, but um, over the years, but maybe we need to have the discussion into the risk base because maybe it goes back to this the the idea that there are some projects, even if they fall in to in the purview, that we're going to look at them in this at this four um, under the planning. Maybe there's also projects, but maybe not all the projects that we will then look at again at the RFP stage, um, much like the unemployment. Um, does that make sense to everybody? That maybe, maybe we, and I don't wanna make this overly complicated, but yet this whole IT is kind of complicated because it's, it is so much of a, there's, there's so many different things. It, it is a little different than building a building. You know? So Representative Curtis. I was just going to think, say that, I mean, maybe that could be what in number four, we help trigger that. It's like, this is a project that rises to a level that we would like to have some additional input. 
before you put out the RFP. I mean, I don't know, but that. That, that, that could be a good, yeah, exactly. That might be where we, because we may all decide, well, no, you know, this is good. Let's just let it go forward. But it also may be something we say, this is something that's big enough that we want to see more. And, and so you're right, that may be where that triggers. Does that make sense, Matt? Anybody else? Yeah, Senator Tyson. Chairman, just so we're cautious, too, of impacting their schedule and timelines and prices could, if certain delays. Yeah. And that's the reason why, you know, I keep bringing this, the secretary into the discussion because I, um, you know, I, I, I served on the, on the procurement committee for the modernization, and I know that's not all over yet, but I learned quite a bit about the whole procurement uh, process. Serving is one of those three, you know, and, uh, and so I really wanted to make sure that we, that we have this, the, you know, the secretary kind of explain, and, and we want to make this so that it works, but yet we're not, um, creating a huge bottleneck, but there might be a bottleneck needed on some cases, you know, so that's, that's the thing. So did you have a question, Matt? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to clarify just a couple things in looking at this. So um, if you're, if you're looking at a draft that inserts this as the, the, the formula that's kind of been put forward by the secretary of this, at this uh, high level plan stage to submit information. And then the, as, as she noted in the statute currently, uh, there's a period of one week during which if at least two members of the committee contact the director of legislative research to request more information, then a, then a meeting is scheduled. So that's the, the rest of how that dynamic plays out. If, if not, then the advice and consent is considered to be given. But if, if there's two members, then that triggers the calling of a meeting and additional information. So in listening to uh, what the committee is saying, so the House Bill 2188 that the committee was briefed on last time envisioned this, that this check happening prior to the execution of contracts. So kind of in that post RFP pre-contract sign stage. So uh, modifying that as well, I don't know if, it's, if that's the direction of, if this first trigger is hit, that wanting information is that, you know, to getting to Senator Holland's point, then is there a desire to get contract or RFP information prior to a contract signed or where, where would the committee want that to be taken? So I think what I'm hearing is that it'd be prior to the RFP going out. Is that what I'm hearing from everybody? If there was warranted more, it'd be prior to the RFP going out. And that was the problem with 2188 was that when we drafted that, I didn't, and, and that was partly my fault, I didn't think about the contract RFP part of it. And we, I think we want to be way before the contract is, is done, so... And I guess to, to Senator Peterson's point, did you want to extend, did you, did you want to say 14 days instead of seven days? Yeah. Or 10? Okay. Maybe 10 days. Let's, let's go 10 days. I think that might be, yeah, that's a good compromise. Um, does that, that answer your questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The the other question discussed, but I don't know if we've you know the idea about what is uh, a project to hit this tr this threshold. I mean, right now, as we've said, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Whether that remains for now, or, or whether that you know is something that you want to have changed. And I think that's where we go into the next discussion with the secretary as far as the risk based. Do we want to? Um, do we want to roll those all into one bill and do the risk base and the and this all into one base or one bill, or do we want to do them in two different bills? Or what's the what are we what are we thinking? 
Well, and maybe, uh, Madam Secretary, could you maybe explain the, the risk base a little bit so more? This is to adjust the trigger for the IT reporting. So currently, as a reminder, your I, the IT reporting, the trigger is a solely a dollar amount currently. It's 250000 Any project above 250000 automatically falls into those quarterly reports, right? So any other project that's going on out there that's under that is not part of what you see in that. So there's many other IT projects going on right now that are not in what I talk about for the quarterly, right? So the idea is to um, make some changes to that legislation, changing the definition of um, the an IT reportable project that um, alters it from a solely a dollar amount, but that has um, a risk space uh, foundation for it. Uh, operational cost in a way that we're able to then um, to ensure that we are including projects that have certain levels of risk and to actually get a little bit more delineation in there. Again, as I talked about earlier, project may not cost a lot, but if it touches uh, personal private information, um, while it still may not be something we want fully reportable, the idea that that this evolution, this process operationally, we could put in steps that say, but we now know that even if it's not a high level project that the necessary data governance steps have been taken care of because during the review, that was the only thing that they needed to do, but they may not have to do quarterly reports for the duration of their project because it's, it wasn't that, right? There are things that as, IT has evolved over the years. A dollar amount is not a singular indication of the impact or risk or the scope of a project. And, and that is some of what, and it's more industry stranded of what's out there versus singular dollar amounts. So there was initially a, uh, there, there's a, a bill, there's a yeah, Senate bill, I believe. I think that there, it's, the, it's, I think that there was that had begun to make, to make those changes. I don't know if, it, if we, if it actually, I don't think it. I don't think the Senate took it up yet. No, it, I don't think so either. So, but, but that it's was still the, there. I, it's two forty nine. Okay. Okay. okay, so that was there. So that was one, and it was talking more about the risk base. But then Representative Hoffman had that there had been one that was introduced that was talking more about this oversight piece. And so I guess the question is, are we thinking to bring those together as we take them forward? And I don't know. I think we'd have talk yeah, through and, what that might look like or, or put our eyes on what that might look like or the how that would come together. So I don't know that right. I have, uh, Well, and the issue is is the, that, the, that the bill 288 referenced, referenced to 250,000. And so, I mean, it has to reference something. And, and so, you know, we would reference, we would either reference, if we, if we weren't gonna go forward with the risk base inside it, we need to reference something. So it's gonna reference the, the current law, which is the 200, or not 288, I'm sorry, 250,000. But it could, I would think that it could reference what, because that 250 is technically the definition of what is defined as an IT reportable project. So if it is tied to whatever IT reportable projects definition is, if, and I'm and oh, you're again, right, exactly. Right. But so, what I'm saying is that if we don't tie them together, then it's and and they don't both go at the same time, then you're you are talking to different certain implications. Things. Yeah. So um I I I guess I kind of am thinking that we ought to tie them together. Um my only and I've brought this up many times, and I and I to the secretary, and I know she is she has also um, talked to to me about it. I I just want to make sure that we have in the risk management or risk based assessment that we have something like maybe it's ITAC that that they're the ones that that are maybe coming up with the the risk, so that we don't have a, a singular. I, you so know, understand we don't want a that secretary that is, coming in and saying... Nope, say, those are governed by a set of policies. So remember okay. how earlier I talked about... Right, I knew you had, so... 500, I'm sorry, 5,000 and 8,000. The... Set, I believe it's 2,000. Oh, my... Sarah's not here. I believe it's the 2000 series that actually governs that as well. So when we were looking at this earlier on, we had started to mark those up 
but we stopped marking those up because we were like, we need to get whatever lands clearly in the legislation and then subsequently would then mark those up accordingly, which are the guiding policies. And then yes, the update of those policies to match the changes to the legislation would need to go through ITEC as well. And so that is the, for lack of a word, like the governing entity or the monitoring entity of like, this is the policies that govern the, the process. So does that help? Yeah, okay. That's what I was, I it wouldn't arbor yeah. said before, but. Correct. Yeah. It wouldn't arbitrarily be a set of policies that could change. It would, ha those policies have to go through ITEC and it is the 2000 series. Thank you. Senator Holland. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I just want to chime in very briefly. I think this all needs to be in one bill. Um, and obviously, we're, it's related subject matter, but really the, the whole bill, thrust the entire bill in my mind is basically just really risk mitigation strategies. And um, the, the point I was trying to make is, is that I, I do fully support that, you know, for projects of a certain dollar amount, we very well, I, I would uh, fully support, you know, increased reporting, increased visibility of, the, of those, those projects. But the thing I want to go back to the committee with Mr. Chairman is, is that the types of, I mean, critical risk projects I'm talking about, they're probably coming along no more than maybe once a year. Uh, I, and so to me, this is not a, a process that is going to, for those critical risk projects, is going to quote unquote bottle anything up. Uh, I'm talking about a very small, finite set of projects of where, it, and these typically may not be necessarily tied to dollars, although obviously they are gonna be more expensive projects, but it's gonna be really more things where, say a vendor is proposing a proprietary solution or a vendor is pro proposing basically extensive amount of consultants or a vendor is proposing a, a, uh, an exotic type of technology of where you, know, you are talking about making a commitment to a vendor for a long time um, where you, know, you will not be able to uh, basically unwind from that relationship if you need to. Um, once again, back to the integration of data and things like that, uh, those could be particularly very inexpensive if not fully understood the project plan really fully understands how those uh, integrations are to be. So just that's what I'm thinking as far as projects where JCIT needs to have a, a up or down prior to that RFP going out. Because once again, I think by JCIT influencing the development of the RFP. And I'm not saying, you know, you know if, the, if the CEDO wants to write the RFP and bring it to the committee, that's great. I would say we've got to write it. What I am saying is that before that RFP goes out, that thing be thoroughly reviewed, okay, and with the discussion, the committee flows executive session or whatever, basically the discussion of what is the space out there, how we think this is going to just, just have a very candid discussion about risk as we embark on one of these more risk areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, and I think, did you hear the, the discussion as far as maybe in that um, where we're inserted in under the planning that there would be then some sort of language to say that if, if it warranted, warranted the, uh, uh, the committee wanted to look at it further before the RFPs put out or if that that would be the part that would be where we would put that language so that's fine but when you say the committee wanted to look at it further I'm just strongly advocating the committee for certain projects says a or name before that RFP goes out right I'm that's, that's what I was meaning yeah it. yeah because there's going to be, like you said, there's going to be most of them that we're, we're, we we'll yeah, we look at them and, them. yeah, but there yeah, will be those I'm big ones, yeah. Okay. You know, but we need a hammer on a few select projects before they ever get out of the room. Okay. 
Uh, Chair Hoffman, just one point of clarification as a reminder that these are not vendor driven. Um, there was a comment made of the, you know, the vendors driving change or pushing that these are agency driven. Um, and so, and one of the things that is a part of this process for, particularly for larger projects, and it's when you typically, as you walk through a feasibility study, you will see is the, the amount of work that is done in that business and operation side in relationship to even before they move into the process of it. So I state all that is because recognizing everything that is, is said here, um, and there's lots of history here, but in that vein of transparency that was talked about earlier, I also think we need to shed a lot more light on what actually is happening um, with the IT professionals that live very closely to it. Because even as CEDOs, as we go through it, I don't make certain um, decisions or questions lightly without going back to that team because they sit closely to the operations and the understanding the business needs that they're trying to help deliver for that agency. So that, that voice and that expertise is a critical piece um, that I want to make sure that we also are taking into the pieces that are here. So right, and I and I think his point was that you're not always going to be secretary, and and the, and as the secretary and as the CTO, um, you, you have quite a bit of power to yes or no on on you know. And so I think his point was that we don't know who the next person or or three or four down the road are going to be. And they may not have the same philosophy as far as looking at projects. You know, that, I think that was his point. So, um, I so I think what we'll do it has is it kind of, is it everybody's um, idea that we put these two bills together, and um, I think we're you have a yeah. Go ahead. Thank you again. So I, I, I think I, I've tracked it pretty well. Uh, two questions. One, uh, actually for the secretary, if there's a definition you want to use for high level plan, just so I can kind of put something in there so that the legislation will address that that moment what that triggers actually the submission of information. The Keto office can provide all that documentation. That is an actual term and it has a definition in the policy as to what it is and what must be included. All of this entire process is fully documented in the policy, so we can make sure that the Keto office provides you whatever you need in terms of that. Wonderful. And then the second question for the committee uh, would be, in combining those two bills, so we're, we're essentially combining that with, with 249, and 249 uh, changes that, that project definition, so that will be used in this. Uh, the last question would be Senate Bill 250 also in this atmosphere with those changes to the Cybersecurity Act, whether that's something the committee wants included in this new bill as well. And um, remind me on that Cybersecurity Act, what that one was. So that, or, or maybe. You. So oh, you can go ahead. Yeah. The general overview on the, and those were at the time as we were moving things to, there was a lot of things when the Cybersecurity Act was written in 2018, that there's things that are outdated or inaccurate and the language was wrong. So as we were working in this area, um, and that's probably been almost two sessions ago, where we were just saying it needed to be cleaned up to be more accurate and reflective, um, because there are a lot of things that are misaligned or not our actual structures, because when that act was written, this did, we didn't have it. And now that it's through the office exists, other policies exist, other things, there are just things that are literally inaccurate and need to be. And so it is one of those things that it is um, at some point needs to be done um, to make it accurate, there may be some other tweaks based on what comes out of the task force that just update the language in terms of what it's tied to for guide uh, for standards nationally or things like that. So it is of a completely different flavor than the space that we're talking about here. But I leave that at you all's discretion. So would you would you rather that we wait on it until the task force has more, or or do you think that we could go ahead and put it in and and uh, 
I don't think we have to wait until the okay. task force has more. And if there's anything in particular, I mean, we can scan through that before, I mean, like by the December to say, at the December meeting to say, oh, you know, there's a recommendation to tie to X, Y, and Z standards. And so that might want to, we might want to update it there or something of that nature. But I don't even know if it, it warrants it, but we can take a look. Okay. All right. Well, I'm okay with putting all three together if that's. So, I, Matt, I think we just put all three together and then we'll. All right. So I think we'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, at our December meeting, we're going to, I'll try to um, make sure we have, you know, quite a bit of time period to um, flush out what Matt has come up with. And then I want everyone to continue to, um, you know, Senator Tyson with the, the idea of the teeth and where we can maybe, you know, we can go there. And I know Senator Holland has quite a bit, and you know, so um, I appreciate, appreciate everybody's input on this and, and um, um, Secretary D'Angelo, I, I appreciate your input on helping us kind of get a, a start in, in where we could, um, where we could get this inserted. So I um, appreciate that quite a bit. So with that, I think we'll go on to our next, um, um, which is the judiciary branch. They're going to give us an IT update. So, Kelly, if you... Yeah, if you want, just hand them out, then we'll get those handed out. Is it on? Yeah, there we go. All right. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I do have a bit of an update. Uh, if you remember last time we talked about some uh, things going on, I'm, I'm actually here to report that the, the project is moving. As of November 1, we did, did install in, in what we refer to as Track 2. Those are the three counties of Butler, Elk, and Greenwood. Uh, currently, we're in the third week of a three-week go live. Every every go live, we have it, it's three weeks long. Obviously, there's questions and things that go beyond three weeks, but uh, we normally have somebody on site, and we have lines open and all kinds of communication available for them to report. As of today, um, all issues that have been reported have been resolved. Um, so we we consider this go live a, a very successful so far. Um, and uh, we, you know, it's, it's just been good. Um, I, I, I do want to also add, last time we talked a little bit about um, uh, where we were at in, in regards to the project. Uh, I do want to make it clear that, that we do have a good relationship with our vendor. Um, there, there's, there, there's uh, you know, there's, there's no bad feelings. Um, we're, we're happy with their product. Um, and we, it's just that we, we needed to, uh, um, uh, we just had to have some discussions to get to the point where we both agreed that, that we were comfortable and we've gotten there. Um, we, we, have, we have started making payments again and so uh, we're looking forward to continue to move forward. Um, as you'll note on, on uh, further down in the update though, we have decided to move out uh, Shawnee and Wichita so the third and the 18th judicial districts. The reason for that and move them out and we don't really know where we're gonna put them yet is as we've done more research inside of those counties, they have built in integrations with, with a lot of different entities inside of the county. So, so they're, they're sharing information, whether that be with the sheriff, whether that be with community corrections or the DA or whoever it may be, and, and what we don't want to do is go in there and break those so all of a sudden there's a lot more work because they've also staffed based off of those integrations, right? So um, what we've decided is we need to do further study and figure out what those integrations, uh, where they're at and how and, and if, I guess, if we're going to recreate those uh, to make sure that there's not any pause in service in those two. So... Uh, we're we're currently doing that 
Um, and as we get that figured out, we will, we will uh, give a go live date for that. But all the rest of the counties, as you can see on there, we, we intend to move forward um, and, and start, uh, start, you know, start through the march of the rest of the counties. Now our next track is what we refer to as track four is um, we have moved Shawnee out of there, but it's still a pretty high volume uh, track for us. We will have Kansas City, Wyandotte in there. We have Douglas County in there. We have Leavenworth. Uh, we have Emporia. So we'll, we'll have we'll have a pretty decent amount of volume in there. Uh, we intend to try to go live with them. Um, it says February 1st, we're gonna say first quarter um, and make, make sure that we can get that going. And then, like you said, we're just gonna step through and, and do the rest um, from that point forward. Um, other than that, that's really kind of my update. So I may get you guys back on schedule a little bit here, but, uh, but I will stand for any questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't think you have to apologize to us for getting the, uh, a vendor's attention. So yeah. no, no, I, I just wanted to make sure that nobody thought that, no. you know, we're sideways with them. We're, we're not sideways with them right. at, at all. We have a, we have a very good relationship. But I'm glad that I'm glad to hear that, that, uh, maybe some of the issues were resolved. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's been a good partnership and we're, we're looking forward to finishing out and, and doing that. So yeah, okay. they have been. Representative Curtis. Thank you. And so a question, I know you addressed why um, Sedgwick County and Wichita were pulled out, but Johnson County is, does that, do they face that same issue? They, they, they do, and I should, you're okay. right. I should talk about Johnson a little bit. John, <laughs> Johnson is, is really, we have what we refer to over at the courts right now, we have the statewide implementation and we have the Johnson County implementation. They are kind of on two separate tracks. Johnson County is actually an addendum to the original contract because they came on later. Um, so I'm not saying that just because they're Johnson County. It's just that the decision was made later, so it was a, it's a different addendum. Um, we do have separate project managers over there um, because they do. Uh, for those who are aware of Johnson County with their gym system over there, they're, they had a lot of the same type of things, these built-in integrations that, that what, we don't want putting the court system in there to make extra work for either the stakeholder or certainly not for the court clerks and, and court staff. So yes, that, that is being looked at as well. So, so yeah, the 13th, the 10th, which is uh, Johnson County and the 18th, those dates are yet to be determined at this point. Do you, do you think you'll blend those in and still be totally completed by the end of next year? Or do you think that that will extend perhaps beyond that? What I can tell you today is we hope to be done by the end of next year. Now, uh, you know, there's a there there uh, Johnson County. We've got a pretty good start on on the third and the 18th. We 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 got a really good understanding. Um, there's actually work being done. Johnson County. We're still trying to do a little bit of the gap analysis, trying to figure out what all the touch points are. Because whenever, well, as soon as we think we have them all, there there's some more that are presented to us, and so we're we're trying to get a get a handle on that and so um but but again to answer your question the goal is to have we we want to have that done by by the end of the year if we can and then i one last question just for wind out it looks like they're in track four and uh -huh. you have quite a few moving there in that in the very first of the year next year yeah moving forward but you don't anticipate any Wyandotte and, and Douglas and others have not had as many integrations. I mean, they have some, uh, but nothing that's real unique from what we haven't already dealt with. So, um, uh, you know, I think we, we got a pretty good handle on, on where they are at. So, and yep. that's why we haven't moved them out yet. And the ones that have been completed, they're, they're up and running and have. They, they are. Um, uh, for the most part, the, the, the last year um, has been spent really tightening up the system. And uh, as I just noted, now again, it's a small track, right? It's three, three counties only. And, uh, but, you know, uh, all, like I said, anything that's been reported really has mostly been training. Um, there have been some gotchas out there, but 
those have all been resolved. So from, from a court operation, from the, the case management system inside of the court with the clerk and the judges and all them, we feel really good about it. We're real, real good about it. We still got a little work to do on, on getting stuff out to stakeholders a little bit, but inside of the court, inside the court walls, we feel really good with where the system is. Any other questions? Okay, Kelly, thank you. Thank you, have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm. You too. All right, next up we have Alan Weiss with uh, our, our, our uh, legislative CETO, and he's gonna give us a report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. If you'll give me a minute, I'm going to share a presentation. <clears throat> Hopefully just a half a minute. So I wanted to provide you with uh, quite a bit of information today. Um, I'm going to summarize some of it because I know we're running a little bit late, but uh, I'll hit the highlights of these slides, but uh, you're, you'll have them available to review. And if you have further questions, we can, I can answer those even after the meeting. But Mr. Chairman, it's, it's up to you. I, I can, we can hold questions to the end or I could start at, stop at certain points and see if there are questions because there's different kind of different categories in here. Okay, yeah, I want you to stop at the certain points. So. Okay. All right, so the, the first slide I have is the update on the information systems uh, request for proposal. And we put out an RFP based on the request by the LCC last year uh, to replace our legislative systems that process and publish the bills, resolutions, statutes, and associated documents. Uh, this past September, September 15th, the LCC passed a motion uh, to release the RFP on or before October 15th. And we released that RFP on uh, October 11th. Uh, we posted that RFP to the legislature's website, so it's available out there if you want to take a look at it uh, on, the, on the legislature's homepage. It's also posted on the uh, Office of Procurement Contracts in the Department of Administration. Uh, we also transmitted the RFP to six vendors with experience in legislative systems. We've got the RFP open for six weeks for bid submission and the due date is this coming Monday, uh, November 22nd. The RFP calls for an implementation time frame of three years, so that's set for October of 2024. And at this time, we have not received any bid submissions, but we expect to see them some come in by Monday. So, uh, this is a good place for questions. If there's any questions about the RFP, I know we hadn't talked about it too much in this committee in the past, but committee, are there any questions on the RFP? All right, uh, the next several slides I have are on our current system, what we call the Kansas Legislative Information Systems and Services and the, and the updates that we do to that. Uh, most of you know this, uh, our systems by the acronym KALIS. So of course KALIS is our current system for publishing the bills and updating the statutes. We implemented that system in 2011 and uh, that effort at the time was to modernize our, our systems. So 
The system consists of data stores, application servers, of course, the workstation clients, and, and about 50 custom applications. And the main goal at the time was to implement a system that, that allowed the public a view into the legislative process from anywhere. And we had uh, other design goals, like making sure that the applications were integrated across the, the branch, that we used open standards and uh, platforms that were secure and easy to update. And then we implemented those into our uh, Statehouse Secure Data Center with uh, a backup and recovery site. So we've continually updated the, these systems since its implementation. And um, there's, there's been many updates, as I've said, and I, the following pages here, will, will I'll, I'll show you some of those updates that we've done um, over the past several years. So this is a list of applications in the lawmaking area. Uh, this is primarily used by the Office of the Reviser staff, and these generally, these applications center around bill drafting, amendment drafting, and statute update. Um, so I, I might note that all these custom applications are, are coded in uh, either Python, Java, JavaScript, or uh, Star Basic. This is a list of applications in the decision support system. And uh, this is primarily used by the research department. These are focused around their, generally their publications and associated bill documents. The next slide is the chamber automation system, we call it. Uh, that's for the House and Senate chamber staff. Uh, the chamber interface, which is where they actually push the bills through the process, of course, the calendars and journals, uh, and then the other associated applications with um, making sure that the, that the uh, bills are processed through the chambers. Also included in here is the committee system, which is it's part of the chamber system, but it's primarily used by the committee assistants. There's also a global system that uh, contains the appointments interface, which is a system for tracking appointments that the legislature is responsible for. Uh, also the universal asset manager, which is a system for system administrators for configuring information in the system. And then of course the, what we call the legislative interface, which is the website. That's a large Python, uh, application that dynamically looks into the chamber system to publish all of our information to the public, staff, and uh, legislators. Uh, maybe any questions on the list of applications? The only thing I'm uh, going back to the RFP, is it um, a, over the shelf or on the, off the shelf? Is that what the RFP is looking more for? It's, it's for a vendor to provide the functionality that we need in the legislature. Now that may include off the shelf components with custom code. I mean, that's what we currently have now. We have, we're using uh, modules and, and uh, we're using the open office uh, editor, but a lot of custom code that goes with that to, to make, to be able to process our information. So I would have suspected any proposals would be similar to that. Yeah, well, my understanding though is Kalis was pretty well a from scratch built. Is that not right? Well, as I said, it, I mean, it was it was built on the uh, Linux operating system, so you have all those um, code modules in Linux that you use, like the programming languages. Uh, the, the data stores are built from from uh, different pieces of of open source software that's out there. So it's it's a combination of code that's been available to the public, but also custom code written on top of that. Anyone else? So uh, again, as I was saying, I've got a few slides here on updates we've made over the years. In the lawmaking system, you can see we've, uh, since 2014 to the present, we've been making quite a bit of updates in, in that area. 
um, rewriting the amendatory report system, which is a system that automatically generates the, the committee reports and floor amendments. Uh, we've also added in 2015, added drafting tools into that system so that they can manually update those reports if needed. Uh, what we call the in-context amendment drafting system or the Delta system, that's where revised staff can, can mark up bills in context uh, and the amendatory report system then uses those documents to, to create what you see as uh, floor amendments and committee reports. Uh, and then we continued on from that point making uh, enhancements to those systems uh, to, to make sure that that system is working for the revisor's office. The next one is the, the chamber automation system. In the 15-16 timeframe, 2015 and 16, we updated the calendar and journal systems to be more accurate and more efficient. Uh, the, the chamber interface, all through since implementation 2012 to the present, We've done miscellaneous updates to make sure that that system works well for them. And that's, if you've ever watched the clerks in the chamber when they're actually processing bills, they have their, it shows them their orders of business and they can move things from introduction to committees and into general orders. And that's how you automatically see those updates on the website as, as bills are, are pushed through the system. Uh, they also use a desktop client, and we've had to make updates in that that correspond to updates that were made in the lawmaking system because of that integration between uh, the chamber and the lawmaking system. Uh, the Senate vote system, we implemented a, a new system that we wrote internally in uh, 2018 to um, uh, record votes in the Senate and that also has uh, allows for vote displays, which we put a vote display in for the chair. And also uh, there's one in the uh, leadership offices for votes. And uh, it's integrated with the current system to publish those votes out to the uh, journals and, and the website. And we're currently working on an update to the chamber system that's gonna allow legislative staff to access and set uh, general orders in a browser-based application. So we're rolling out an application to, to uh, leadership staff, which is kind of fun. Uh, the dis decision support system in 2015, we updated their budget analysis system, actually creating a new application to help them compile that report together and um, worked on the interim committee report in 16 and 17, and also the summary of legislation in that, in that time frame. The committee system, we added the committee system to the um, suite of applications, you might call it, in 2013 with the standing committees. And then in 2014, we added the uh, interim committee agendas and minutes. And um, that, that system, of course, allows the committee assistants to create those documents and get published to the website. Uh, through the 2015-20 timeframe, we've tweaked that system many times to, um, with updates as needed by uh, input from staff and, and uh, the division, mostly LAS. And in 2020, we added a feature to uh, do early release of testimony and post-committee documents on the website. So we continue to update that system as needed. The uh, updates on the other systems, Universal Asset Manager, that was implemented after we implemented the main system in 2012. And that, as I said, allows our administrators to update information on members, committee, staff, sessions, users, roles, uh, divisions, et cetera. The appointment system, again, that's for mainly KLRD to track the appointments in the state so they can uh, look and see when appointments are due and notify agencies and appointing authorities when they need to be uh, reappointing people to boards and committees and commissions and so forth. 
Uh, we've also added search systems in for uh, decision su support in the chambers, and uh, we'll be rolling that out to the rest of the system. The website uh, in the 2016 through 21 timeframe, we've added several features for transparency, and I've got a couple slides here later on. I'll, I'll go through those. Uh, we also, in 2016, added a feature to put custom messages up on the website easily for our system administrators. Um, an example of that is that RFP message on the front page of the website. That's, that's an example of that. In uh, 2021, this year, we've done a, a pretty big update project to get the code updated to Python 3 from Python 2. And uh, we switched over the web server from uh, Apache to Nginx for better performance and security. And we're also updating the OS and, on the website. The core system, this core system is what uh, Propylon has provided and maintains for us. It's a set of data stores and utility servers, application servers. Uh, the data stores or where we store all the documents and it has a metadata function in it. So all the metadata on the document is, is available. And uh, it also has a full revisioning. So all the updates to documents in the system, we can go back and look at the complete history of those. And um, we have four main data stores, the, the lawmaking system, decision support, chamber automation, and global. And uh, I'm on slide 15 if you're following along with me. This is the core updates we've done to the system over the years. We initially started out with what they called LWB, but then we've moved in up through the versions up to uh, last year we put in LRMS version 6.3. So we've kept that up to date uh, with, with Propylon's core system. Throughout uh, the years of, since we've implemented it, so I might stop here, see if there's any questions about all, uh, these updates we've done with the system over the years. Senator Tyson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You talked about the appointment system that was added. Did uh, the administration pay for that or did the uh, legislative portion of the budget pay for it? I think uh, at the time when we implemented that, we had a support contract with Propylon and they did that work based under the, what we was paying for the support contract. So that came out of the legislature's budget, not the governor's budget. Correct. I think we might want to look into that a little bit. But was it, was it appointments from the administration or is it appointments of all the various um, legislative appointments? Both. And both. Okay, it's, it's, it's both. Okay. It's basically all appointments that the legislature would need to confirm. But it's not a responsibility of the legislature. It's a responsibility of the administration. So we provided a tool for the administration. Right. Yeah, evidently. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking it, it was for legislative leadership in, in making appointments to the various things that they make appointments to, not... It is that also. Okay. I mean, it's, it's for KLRD to, to track those because then they have to provide that information to the Senate Confirmation Committee. And that then gets pushed through the chamber system and, and displayed on the website as, as okay. confirmed appointments. Right. So, yeah, something. Thank you. I understand. It's something that we need to look into, though, because the dates and the calendar wouldn't be part of our... I mean, we're on such a tight budget these days. Being sarcastic because all the federal money coming in. Um, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, also, I know the statutes are available, but are, I can't find the rules and regs on KLIS website. Is it available on there? It is not. We do, we do not track rules and regs. Yeah, and as a legislator, I often need those, so I have to go to another system in order to get those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Did you have something? So it, it, that appointment system is for appointments only for Senate confirmation. So it would be only the executive branch 
appointments. Okay, yeah. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know Alan and your team inherited um, quite an ordeal, and you guys have taken a system that was very difficult to use and uh, made it much better. So thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead, Alan. All right, uh, transparency implementations, as I call them, from 2016 to 2020. In 2016, we added a web page uh, that lists all the committee bill hearings to the website and also added committee hearings uh, on the bill pages under bill history so that those are listed. Uh, 2017, we, we added uh, committee minutes and testimony links on the bill pages, and I believe that was a request from this committee back then. Uh, 2018, we added requested by requested for information to the bill pages on the website. And we also built an application used by the revisor's office staff to, to input that information. 2019, a new page was created on the website to display the conference committee schedule. And we also created another application for the revisor's office uh, to be able to input those conference committee meetings. Uh, associated with the conference committee work, also in 2019, we updated the, the bill page to, to have a separate table for conference committee report versions, and then also added an RSS feed to uh, get notifications on conference committees. In 2020, we added an application, again, for revisor staff to update the short titles of bills quickly as required, and those updates are then are pushed throughout the system and, and displayed on the website. And, uh, and again, as I mentioned, in 2021, we added to the committee system and the website to allow early release of testimony and posting of uh, committee documents. Any questions on those, those updates? Okay. We've implemented the systems throughout our legislative bienniums. Each, each time we uh, switch over to a new biennium, we have to implement a new set of, of data stores, application servers, and utility servers. We also do that for the special sessions that we did in 13, 2013, 2016, and 2020. And, uh, we are in the midst now of setting up for, for next week, uh, testing and making sure everything is, is ready for that system. So uh, to give you some, just some idea, you know, we have to continue running the, the current environment for the 21-22 session, at the same time setting up this separate system to be able to input bills that are just specific for the special session. So they're, they're separate, but we kind of link them together on the website. And um, we're also uh, started taking our older biennium systems and putting those into an archive system for longer term storage and retrieval and also easier maintenance. Uh, the state house infrastructure, I put in a slide here to show you that, um, as I mentioned, we have our state house secure data center that's down in the, uh, that was implemented in 2009 for our information systems down in the uh, State House Southwest sub-basement. And uh, there's, I call it four levels of physical security to get into that, that data center. We also have an offsite da data center located in Kansas City, Missouri in the, what they call the Subtropolis location. In our data center, we have a, a virtual private cloud that is a system using VMware on, on Cisco Hyperflex hyper-converged infrastructure. So we've been running a virtual environment since uh, 2009 for our Kalis systems, and we've migrated all of our other email systems and uh, general network file systems into that virtual environment. So uh, we are pretty much completely virtual now. In our, in our Kalis environments, we run a of course, the production system, but we also have 
a staging environment, a test environment, a development environment, and a failover environment so that we can go through completely develop, develop new features and functions, move those into testing, and move those up into staging and production as, uh, as we progress so that we are not af affecting anything in production without the final release. And uh, of course, the offsite failover system is there in case we need that for uh, major disasters. We back up those systems in, in our rubric system and uh, our state house network, which uh, was upgraded. The wiring in the building was upgraded during uh, capital restoration. And we've been running one gigabyte bits per second to the desktop, but we've recently updated that, that network to run 10, 10 gigabits in between the switches on the backbone. That's all running over fiber optic and uh, CAT6 wire in the building. So any questions about the uh, infrastructure or the bionemes? All right, the, the Kansas Virtual State House. If you remember, this is a project we embarked on last year to install these video conference systems throughout the State House. We put in 27 room systems, uh, 13 of those in committee rooms, two in the chambers, 10 conference rooms, and a couple systems in the visitor center. And uh, we implemented Cisco WebEx throughout uh, the branch of government for the legislators and staff to use. Again, we, we updated the uh, state house network, our switches and routers to make sure we could handle the traffic. We upgraded all the audio systems in the committee rooms. We upgraded the streaming service so that we could have video and audio streaming from the committee rooms, which we previously didn't have. We just had audio streaming. Uh, we also implemented the closed captioning system through the WebEx, which you see on the monitor over here to my uh, left. Uh, continuing on the virtual state house, um, we implemented the virtual voting in the, in the house chamber as, as part of the uh, need to do some distancing in the, in the house chamber and uh, implemented new voting boards, which are gonna be used in the uh, 2022 session in the house. Uh, we updated the state house data center firewall up to, it was on one, one gigabits per second. We upgraded that to uh, 10 gigabits for, for speed increase and enhanced security and uh, did a memory update on the um, Hyperflex servers in the data center. We updated and reconfigured our email system for better efficiency, updated the rubric system, backup system for increased capacity, and also we did uh, training on the video conference systems. That's all work we, we did <laughs> last year to, to uh, get this virtual state house operational. The timeline, um, I'll just briefly touch on this. We, we started that project last July with a request from the budget committee and uh, we get down to the final approval on uh, November 19th when the LCC approved it, the contract with Worldwide Technology for uh, doing the Cisco system. The chair of the LCC assigned the contract that same day we started the installation of the systems November 24th last year, and we had seven weeks left before session. And uh, amazingly, they, they got all the rooms set up and ready to go. Fortunately, it didn't, it didn't leave us much time for testing and process development, but uh, we were able to use the systems during the session. Funding we did for the virtual state house was uh, through the, the CARES Act in the Kansas Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, September, we submitted this, the request for funding. The Spark Committee approved that. State Financial Council approved it. And uh, total expenditures on that were $4.73 million. Uh, this is information, some stats on what we did last session on the meetings. I provided this information to the committee previously. Uh, but I threw it in here just so you could see it again. And coming up for the 2022 session, 
we're expanding out our control room down in 39E so we can do uh, better control over these WebEx systems with uh, consoles and computers and monitors in there. Um, <clears throat> we're also implementing a test committee room system so we can test configuration changes or equipment and also use that equipment as hot, sw hot swap spares for the committee rooms. And uh, we're also looking at uh, portable room video conference systems for remote meetings as needed. Any questions on the virtual state house? Okay. Other projects uh, that, that happened last year are currently, we rolled out new legislative computers last year in the fall of 2020. We also implemented new printers throughout the state house and during the legislative session this year. And we're currently working on new staff legislator computers. It's a current project. Dell's been selected as a, as a vendor. Um, we do have supply chain issues with getting those computers. So we're not gonna get them prior to the start of session. They're gonna come in after session. Excuse me, yeah. So we're gonna hold off on implementing any of those computers until at least April so we don't disrupt the legislative session. And um, when, the, when we get the final contract here, hopefully in a few days, we'll, the LCC has given us approval for the LCC chair, Senator Masterson to approve that contract. We're also gonna be doing a security audit uh, this, this uh, fiscal year across all of our systems. I just want to note that um, we, we've probably reported this before, but we do have a strict change control policy and procedure in place. Any changes to our production systems, we make sure we document that, review it, and, and push that through the change control team before it's implemented. And our change control team is uh, the change man manager is Terry Clark, who is in the back of the room today. And our release manager, Eric Thiel, he's also back here today. And then a change control board, which is made up of selected members of staff uh, on the affected systems. Any questions on uh, the, those projects or the change control procedure? All right, we're getting very near the end. Uh, organizational updates. So I wanted to make some changes to the way our information services office is organized. So I've reorganized two existing FTE positions into the following, the information technology systems architect and an information technology security engineer. We also had uh, two FTEs added to our office uh, for the virtual state house and those positions are the audiovisual coordinator and the audiovisual specialist. So the information technology security engineer, uh, you can see the responsibilities here, but uh, highlights is to develop an IT strategy for the legislature, review alerts, um, manage an inventory of our critical systems, um, and lead our, our staff through analyzing any security incidents, which is pretty important and be involved in that change control process to make sure that our system stays secure. That position I, we will be advertising for and see if we can get somebody hired in for that. Information technology systems architect. This position I offered to Donnie Hinton, who is one of our current employees and uh, Donnie has accepted that position. He is, Donnie has been with us for about 10 years now. Um, and this position is to maintain an architecture for our branch of government uh, and maintain an inventory of our critical systems. Uh, very important to lead development in our core software libraries and of course assist in uh, policy development and uh, develop and maintain a data management plan for the legislature. So I think both of those positions are gonna be very important for us to uh, make sure we have 
secure and well-architected systems. The auto visual coordinator position, uh, I've offered this position to Robin Crumpton, who is one of our current employees, and she has accepted that position. Robin has also with, been with us for about 10 years now. And the responsibilities there are to coordinate the operations of the uh, virtual state house. We're closely with legislators and committee chairs, committee assistants and staff to organize and operate meetings. Report to myself and the director of uh, legislative administrative services on meetings and operations. Develop policies again uh, on the audiovisual systems and uh, review uh, change requests to make sure that it, there's no adverse effects to those systems. So I believe that's the end of my presentation. Are there any, any questions over the, the reorganization or anything else? Committee, any questions? So the other, the specialist, you are putting that out for um, opening. Yeah, that, that one will be, will be advertised. Any other questions? Alan, thank you. Thank you. All right, committee. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, um, I'm just going to, we've got one more meeting yet that we can, uh, that we're going to do in December. We can come up with recommendations then in, in that meeting. So we're going to, um, I'm going to ask you to, to bring those recommendations to the next meeting. If you could, it would be helpful, I think, to staff if you jot them down, uh, you know, send an email and, and uh, send them to uh, um, James, and that way he can then disseminate them out into some sort of a, of a uh, um, paper to give to us. A memo, yeah, sorry. My mind is a memo to, to give to us as we go through them, and then we can decide if we want to add them in. I know that... Uh, um, Senator Peterson had circled the uh, recommendation to KSDE um, to establish a set of minimum IT standards. That was one of the things that he he circled. So I'm sure that's something that we'll we'll want to look at. So so between now and then, please think about recommendations for us to put out for a report, and then also um, the uh, any changes or additions that you might want us to look at for um, the, uh, the bill that we're going to implement or to, that we're going to uh, introduce. And then if there's anything that any of you would like to see us uh, look at in this next meeting, please uh, let myself or James know, and uh, we'll see if we can maybe uh, get those, get that uh, put on the agenda. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all for coming, and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Well, I guess we'll see you Monday <laughs> before Thanksgiving. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>